Section 16 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book four chapter two transactions in christmas sound with an account of the country and its inhabitants seventeen seventy four december the morning of the twenty first was calm and pleasant after breakfast i set out with two boats to look for a more secure station we had no sooner got round or above the point under which the ship lay, then we found a cove in which was anchorage in thirty, twenty, and fifteen fathoms the bottom stones and sand. At the head of the cove was a stony beach, a valley covered with wood and a stream of fresh water, so that there was everything we could expect to find in such a place, or rather more for we shot three geese out of four that we saw and caught some young ones which we afterwards let go after discovering and sounding this cove i sent lieutenant clark who commanded the other boat on board with orders to remove the ship into this place while i proceeded farther up the inlet i presently saw that the land we were under which disjoined the two arms, as mentioned before, was an island at the north end of which the two channels united. After this I hastened on board and found everything in readiness to weigh, which was accordingly done, and all the boats sent ahead to tow the ship round the point. But at that moment a light breeze came in from the sea, too scant to fill our sails so that we were obliged to drop the anchor again for fear of falling upon the point and to carry out a kedge to windward that being done we hove up the anchor warped up to and weighed the kedge and proceeding round the point under our stay sails there anchored with the best bower in twenty fathoms and moored with the other bower which lay to the north in thirteen fathoms in this position we were shut in from the sea by the point above mentioned which was in one with the extremity of the inlet to the east some islets off the next point above us covered us from the northwest from which quarter the wind had the greatest fetch and our distance from the shore was about one third of a mile thus situated we went to work to clear a place to fill water to cut wood and to set up a tent for the reception of a guard which was thought necessary as we had already discovered that barren as this country is it was not without people though we had not yet seen any mr wales also got his observatory and instruments on shore but it was with the greatest difficulty he could find a place of sufficient stability and clear of the mountains which everywhere surrounded us to set them up in and at last he was obliged to content himself with the top of a rock not more than nine feet over next day i sent lieutenants clark and pickersgill accompanied by some of the other officers to examine and draw a sketch of the channel on the other side of the island and i went myself in another boat accompanied by the botanists to survey the northern parts of the sound in my way i landed on the point of a low isle covered with herbage part of which had been lately burnt we likewise saw a hut signs sufficient that people were in the neighbourhood after i had taken the necessary bearings we proceeded round the east coast of burnt island 
and over to what we judged to be the main of Terra del Fuego, where we found a very fine harbour encompassed by steep rocks of vast height, down which ran many limpid streams of water, and at the foot of the rocks some tufts of trees fit for little else but fuel. This harbour, which I shall distinguish by the name of Devil's Basin, is divided, as it were, into two, an inner and an outer one, and the communication between them is by a narrow channel five fathoms deep. In the outer basin I found thirteen and seventeen fathoms water, and in the inner seventeen and twenty-three. This last is as secure a place as can be, but nothing can be more gloomy. The vast height of the savage rocks which encompass it deprived great part of it, even on this day, of the meridian sun. The outer harbour is not quite free from this inconvenience, but far more so than the other. It is also rather more commodious and equally safe. It lies in the direction of north, a mile and a half distant from the east end of Burnt Island. I likewise found a good anchoring place a little to the west of this harbour, before a stream of water that comes out of a lake or large reservoir, which is continually supplied by a cascade falling into it. Leaving this place, we proceeded along the shore to the westward and found other harbours which I had not time to look into. In all of them is fresh water and wood for fuel, but except these little tufts of bushes, the whole country is a barren rock, doomed by nature to everlasting sterility. The low islands, and even some of the higher, which lie scattered up and down the sound, are indeed mostly covered with shrubs and herbage, the soil a black rotten turf, evidently composed by length of time of decayed vegetables. I had an opportunity to verify what we had observed at sea, that the sea coast is composed of a number of large and small islands, and that the numerous inlets are formed by the junction of several channels, at least so it is here. On one of these low islands we found several huts, which had lately been inhabited, and near them was a good deal of celery, with which we loaded our boat and returned on land at seven o'clock in the evening. In this expedition we met with little game, one duck, three or four shags, and about that number of rails or sea pies being all we got. The other boat returned on board some hours before, having found two harbours on the west side of the other channel, the one large and the other small, but both of them safe and commodious. Though by the sketch Mr. Pickersgill had taken of them, the access to both appeared rather intricate. I was now told of a melancholy accident which had befallen one of our marines. He had not been seen since eleven or twelve o'clock the preceding night. It was supposed that he had fallen overboard, out of the head, where he had been last seen and was drowned. Having fine pleasant weather on the 23rd, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill in the cutter to explore the east side of the sound, and went myself in the pinnace to the west side, with an intent to go round the island under which we were at anchor, and which I shall distinguish by the name of Shag Island, in order to view the passage leading to the harbours Mr. Pickerskill had discovered the day before, on which I made the following observations. In coming from sea, leave all the rocks and islands lying often within York Minster on your larboard side, and the black rock which lies off the south end of Shag Island on your starboard. And when abreast of the south end of that island, haul over for the west shore, taking care to avoid the beds of weeds you will see before you, as they always grow on rocks. 
some of which I have found twelve fathoms under water, but it is always best to keep clear of them. The entrance to the large harbour, or Port Clark, is just to the north of some low rocks lying off a point on Shag Island. This harbour lies in west by south, a mile and a half, and hath in it from twelve to twenty-four fathoms depth, wood and fresh water. About a mile without, or to the southward of Port Clark, is, or seemed to be, another which I did not examine. It is formed by a large island which covers it from the south and east winds. Without this island, that is, between it and York Minster, the sea seems strewed with islets, rocks and breakers. In proceeding round the south end of Shag Island, we observe the shags to breed in vast numbers on the cliffs of the rock. Some of the old ones we shot, but could not come at the young ones, which are by far the best eating. On the east side of the island we saw some geese, and having with difficulty landed we killed three, which at this time was a valuable acquisition. About seven in the evening we got on board, where Mr. Pickersgill had arrived but just before. He informed me that the land opposite to our station was an island, which he had been round, that on another, more to the north, he found many turns' eggs, and that without the great island, between it and the east head, lay a cove in which were many geese, one only of which he got, beside some young goslings. This information of Mr. Pickersgill's induced me to make up two shooting parties next day, Mr. Pickersgill and his associates going in the cutter, and myself and the botanists in the pinnace. Mr. Pickersgill went by the northeast side of the large island above mentioned, which obtained the name of Goose Island, and I went by the southwest side. As soon as we got under the island, we found plenty of shags in the cliffs, but Without staying to spend our time and shot upon these, we proceeded on, and presently found sport enough, for in the south side of the island were abundance of geese. It happened to be the molting season, and most of them were on shore for that purpose, and could not fly. There being a great surf, we found great difficulty in landing, and very bad climbing over the rocks when we were landed so that hundreds of the geese escaped us, some into the sea and others up into the island. We, however, by one means or other, got sixty-two, with which we returned on board all heartily tired. But the acquisition we had made overbalanced every other consideration, and we sat down with a good appetite to supper on part of what the preceding day had produced. Mr. Pickersgill and his associates had got on board some time before us with fourteen geese, so that I was able to make distribution to the whole crew, which was the more acceptable on account of the approaching festival. For had not Providence thus singularly provided for us, our Christmas cheer must have been salt beef and pork. I now learnt that a number of the natives in nine canoes had been alongside the ship and some on board. Little address was required to persuade them to either, for they seemed to be well enough acquainted with Europeans, and had amongst them some of their knives. The next morning, the 25th, they made us another visit. I found them to be of the same nation I had formerly seen in Success Bay, and the same which Monsieur de Bougainville distinguishes by the name of Pacheras, a word which they had on every occasion in their mouths. They are a little, ugly, half-starved, beardless race. I saw not a tall person amongst them. They are almost naked. Their clothing was a seal-skin, some had two or three sewn together, so as to make a cloak which reached to the knees, 
but the most of them had only one skin, hardly large enough to cover their shoulders, and all their lower parts were quite naked. The women, I was told, cover their nakedness with the flap of a seal skin, but in other respects are clothed like the men. They, as well as the children, remained in the canoes. I saw two young children at the breast entirely naked. Thus they are inured from their infancy to cold and hardships. They had with them bows and arrows and darts, or rather harpoons, made of bone and fitted to a staff. I suppose they were intended to kill seals and fish. They may also kill whales with them, as the Esquimaux do. I know not if they resemble them in their love of train oil, but they and everything they had smelt most intolerably of it. I ordered them some biscuit, but did not observe them so fond of it as I had been told. They were much better pleased when I gave them some medals, knives, etc. The women and children, as before observed, remained in their canoes. These were made of bark, and in each was a fire, over which the poor creatures huddled themselves. I cannot suppose that they carry a fire in their canoes for this purpose only, but rather that it may be always ready to remove ashore wherever they land. For let their method of obtaining fire be what it may, they cannot be always sure of finding dry fuel that will kindle from a spark. They likewise carry in their canoes large seal hides, which I judged were to shelter them when at sea, and to serve as covering to their huts on shore, and occasionally to be used for sails. They all retired before dinner, and did not wait to partake of our Christmas cheer. Indeed, I believe no one invited them, and for good reasons for their dirty persons and the stench they carried about them were enough to spoil the appetite of any European, and that would have been a real disappointment, as we had not experienced such fare for some time. Roast and boiled geese, goose pie, etc., was a treat little known to us, and we had yet some Madeira wine left, which was the only article of our provision that was mended by keeping so that our friends in England did not, perhaps, celebrate Christmas more cheerfully than we did. On the 26th, little wind next to a calm and fair weather, except in the morning, when we had some showers of rain. In the evening, when it was cold, the natives made us another visit, and it being distressing to see them stand trembling and naked on the deck, I could not do less than give them some bays and old canvas to cover themselves. Having already completed our water, on the 27th I ordered the wood, tent, and observatory to be got on board, and as this was work for the day, a party of us went in two boats to shoot geese, the weather being fine and pleasant. We proceeded round by the south side of Goose Island and picked up in all 31. On the east side of the island, to the north of the east point, is good anchorage in 17 fathoms water, where it is entirely landlocked. This is a good place for ships to lie in that are bound to the west. On the north side of this isle, I observed three fine coves, in which were both wood and water, but it being near night, I had no time to sound them, though I doubt not there is anchorage. The way to come at them is by the west end of the island. When I returned on board, I found everything got off the shore and the launch in, so that we now only waited for a wind to put to sea. The festival which we celebrated at this place occasioned my giving it the name of Christmas Sound. The entrance, which is three leagues wide, is situated in the latitude of 55 degrees 27 minutes south, longitude 70 degrees 16 minutes west, and in the direction of north 37 degrees west from St. Ildefonso Isles, distant 10 leagues. 
These isles are the best landmark for finding the sound. York Minster, which is the only remarkable land about, will hardly be known by a stranger from any description that can be given of it, because it alters its appearance according to the different situations it is viewed from. Besides the Black Rock, which lies off the end of Shag Island, there is another about midway between this and the east shore. A copious description of this sound is unnecessary, as few would be benefited by it. Anchorage, tufts of wood and fresh water will be found in all the coves and harbours. I would advise no one to anchor very near the shore for the sake of having a moderate depth of water, because there I generally found a rocky bottom. The refreshments to be got here are precarious, as they consist chiefly of wild fowl, and may probably never be found in such plenty as to supply the crew of a ship, and fish, so far as we can judge, are scarce. Indeed, the plenty of wild fowl made us pay less attention to fishing. Here are, however, plenty of mussels, not very large, but well tasted, and very good celery is to be met with on several of the low islands, and where the natives have their habitation. The wild fowl are geese, ducks, sea pies, shags, and that kind of gull so often mentioned in this journal under the name of Port Egmont Hen. Here is a kind of duck called by our people racehorses on account of the great swiftness with which they run on the water, for they cannot fly, the wings being too short to support the body in the air. This bird is at the Falkland Islands, as appears per, by Pernetti's journal. Footnote. See Pernetti's journal, pages 244 and 213. End footnote. The geese tour there and seem to be very well described under the name of bustards. They are much smaller than our English tame geese, but eat as well as any I ever tasted. They have short black bills and yellow feet. The gander is all white. The female is spotted black and white or grey, with a large white spot in each wing. Besides the bird above mentioned, here are several other aquatic and some land ones, but of the latter not many. From the knowledge which the inhabitants seem to have of Europeans, we may suppose that they do not live here continually, but retire to the north during the winter. I have often wondered that these people do not clothe themselves better, since nature has certainly provided materials. They might line their sealskin cloaks with the skins and feathers of aquatic birds. They might make their cloaks larger and employ the same skins for other parts of clothing, for I cannot suppose they are scarce with them. They were ready enough to part with those they had to our people, which they hardly would have done had they not known where to have got more. In short, of all the nations I have seen, the Pacheras are the most wretched. They are doomed to live in one of the most inhospitable climates in the world without having sagacity enough to provide themselves with such conveniences as may render life in some measure more comfortable. Barren as this country is, it abounds with a variety of unknown plants and gave sufficient employment to Mr. Forster and his party. The tree which produceth the winter's bark is found here in the woods, as is the holy-leaved barbary, and some other sorts which I know not, but I believe are common in the Straits of Mangle Hens. We found plenty of a berry which we called the cranberry, because they are nearly of the same colour, size and shape. It grows on a bushy plant, has a bitterish taste, rather insipid, but may be eaten either raw or in tarts, and is used as food by the natives. End of section 16. Section 17 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2.
This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 3. Range from Christmas Sound, round Cape Horn, through Strait Le Maire, and round Staten Land, with an account of the discovery of a harbour in that island, and a description of the coasts. 1774 December. At four o'clock in the morning on the 28th, we began to unmoor, and at eight weighed and stood out to sea with a light breeze at northwest, which afterwards freshened and was attended with rain. At noon, the east point of the sound, Point Nativity, bore north a half west, distant one and a half leagues, and St. Ildefonso Isles, southeast a half south, distant seven leagues. The coast seemed to trend in the direction of east by south, but the weather being very hazy, nothing appeared distinct. We continued to steer southeast by east and east southeast with a fresh breeze at west northwest till four o'clock p.m. when we hauled to the south in order to have a nearer view of St. Ildefonso Isles. At this time we were abreast of an inlet which lies east-southeast, about seven leagues from the sound, but it must be observed that there are some isles without this distinction. At the west point of the inlet are two high-peaked hills, and below them to the east two round hills or isles, which lie in the direction of northeast and southwest of each other. An island, or what appeared to be an island, lay in the entrance, and another but smaller inlet appeared to the west of this. Indeed, the coast appeared indented and broken as usual. At half past five o'clock, the weather clearing up gave us a good sight of Ile de Fonso Isles. They are a group of islands and rocks above water, situated about six leagues from the main and in the latitude of 55 degrees 53 minutes south, longitude 69 degrees 41 minutes west. We now resumed our course to the east, and at sunset, the most advanced land bore southeast by east, three quarter east, and a point which I judged to be the west point of Nassau Bay, discovered by the Dutch fleet under the command of Admiral Hermite in 1624, bore north 80 degrees east, six leagues distant. In some charts, this point is called False Cape Horn, as being the southern point of Terra del Fuego. It is situated in latitude 55 degrees 39 minutes south. From the inlet above mentioned to this false cape, the direction of the coast is nearly east, half a point south, distant 14 or 15 leagues. At 10 o'clock, having shortened sail, we spent the night in making short boards under the topsails, and at three next morning made sail and steered southeast by south, with a fresh breeze at west-southwest, the weather somewhat hazy. At this time, the west entrance to Nassau Bay extended from north by east to northeast to half east, and the south side of Hermite's Isles east by south. At four, Cape Horn, for which we now steered, bore east by south. It is known at a distance by a high round hill over it, a point to the west-northwest shows a surface not unlike this, but their situations alone will always distinguish the one from the other. At half-past seven we passed this famous cape and entered the southern Atlantic Ocean. It is the very same point of land I took for the cape 
when I passed it in 1769, which at that time I was doubtful of. It is the most southern extremity on a group of islands of unequal extent lying before Nassau Bay, known by the name of Hermite Islands, and is situated in the latitude of 55 degrees 58 minutes and in the longitude of 68 degrees 13 minutes west, according to the observations made of it in 1769. But the observations which we had in Christmas Sound and reduced to the Cape by the watch, and others which we had afterwards, and reduced back to it by the same means, place it in 67 degrees 19 minutes. It is most probable that a mean between the two, viz. 67 degrees 46 minutes, will be nearest the truth. On the northwest side of the Cape are two peak rocks, like sugar loaves. They lie northwest by north and southeast by south by compass of each other. Some other straggling low rocks lie west of the Cape and one south of it, but they are all near the shore. From Christmas Sound to Cape Horn, the course is east-southeast one quarter east, distant 31 leagues. In the direction of east-northeast, three leagues from Cape Horn, is a rocky point which I called Mistaken Cape and is the southern point of the easternmost of Hermite Isles. Between these two capes there seemed to be a passage directly into Nassau Bay. Some small isles were seen in the passage and the coast on the west side had the appearance of forming good bays or harbours. In some charts, Cape Horn is laid down as belonging to a small island. This was neither confirmed nor can it be contradicted by us, for several breakers appeared on the coast, both to the east and west of it, and the hazy weather rendered every object indistinct. The summits of some of the hills were rocky, but the sides and valleys seemed covered with a green turf and wooded in tufts. From Cape Horn we steered east by north a half north, which direction carried us without the rocks that lie off mistaken Cape. These rocks are white with the dung of fowls, and vast numbers were seen about them. After passing them, we steered northeast a half east and northeast for Strait La Mer, with a view of looking into Success Bay to see if there were any traces of the adventure having been there. At eight o'clock in the evening, drawing near the strait, we shortened sail and hauled the wind. At this time, the sugar loaf on Terra del Fuego wore north 33 degrees west, the point of Success Bay, just open of the Cape of the same name, bearing north 20 degrees east, and Staten Land, extending from north 53 degrees east to 67 degrees east. Soon after, the wind died away, and we had light airs and calms by turns till near noon the next day, during which time we were driven by the current over to Statenland. The calm being succeeded by a light breeze at north-northwest, we stood over for Success Bay, assisted by the currents which set to the north. Before this we had hoisted our colours and fired two guns and soon after saw a smoke rise out of the woods above the south point of the bay, which I judged was made by the natives, as it was at the place where they resided when I was here in 1769. As soon as we got off the bay, I sent Lieutenant Pickersgill to see if any traces remained of the adventure having been there lately and in the meantime we stood on and off with the ship. At two o'clock the current turned and set to the south, and Mr. Pickersgill informed me, when he returned, that it was falling water on shore, 
which was contrary to what I had observed when I was here before, for I thought then that the flood came from the north. Mr. Pickersgill saw not the least signs of any ship having been there lately. I had inscribed our ship's name on a card, which he nailed to the tree at the place where the endeavour watered. This was done with a view of giving Captain Furneaux some information, in case he should be behind us and put in here. On Mr. Pickersgill's landing, he was courteously received by several of the natives, who were clothed in guanaco and sealskins, and had on their arms bracelets made of silver wire, and wrought not unlike the hilt of a sword, being no doubt the manufacture of some Europeans. They were the same kind of people we had seen in Christmas Sound, and, like them, repeated the word pechera on every occasion. One man spoke much to Mr. Pickersgill, pointing first to the ship and then to the bay, as if he wanted her to come in. Mr. Pickersgill said the bay was full of whales and seals, and we had observed the same in the strait, especially on the Terra del Fuego side, where the whales in particular are exceedingly numerous. As soon as the boat was hoisted in, which was not till near six o'clock, we made sail to the east with a fine breeze at north. For since we had explored the south coast of Terra del Fuego, I resolved to do the same by Staten Land, which I believe to have been as little known as the former. At nine o'clock, the wind freshening and veering to northwest, we tacked and stood to southwest in order to spend the night, which proved none of the best, being stormy and hazy with rain. Next morning at three o'clock we bore up for the east end of Statenland, which at half past four bore south sixty degrees east, the west end south two degrees east, and the land of Terra del Fuego south forty degrees west. Soon after I had taken these bearings, the land was again obscured in a thick haze, and we were obliged to make way, as it were, in the dark, for it was but now and then we got a sight of the coast. As we advanced to the east, we perceived several islands of unequal extent lying off the land. There seemed to be a clear passage between the easternmost and the one next to it to the west. I would gladly have gone through this passage and anchored under one of the islands to have waited for better weather, for on sounding we found only twenty-nine fathoms water. But when I considered that this was running to leeward in the dark, I chose to keep without the islands and accordingly hauled off to the north. At eight o'clock we were abreast of the most eastern isle, distant from it about two miles, and had the same depth of water as before. I now shortened sail to the three topsails, to wait for clear weather, for the fog was so thick that we could see no other land than this island. After waiting an hour, and the weather not clearing, we bore up and hauled round the east end of the island, for the sake of smooth water and anchorage, if it should be necessary. In hauling round we found a strong race of a current, like unto broken water, but had no less than nineteen fathoms. We also saw on the island abundance of seals and birds. This was a temptation too great for people in our situation to withstand, to whom fresh provisions of any kind were acceptable, and determined me to anchor in order that we might taste of what we now only saw at a distance. At length, after making a few boars, fishing as it were, for the best ground, we anchored in twenty-one fathoms water, a stony bottom, about a mile from the island, which extended from north eighteen degrees east to north fifty-five and a half degrees west. And soon after the weather clearing up, we saw Cape St. John, 
or the east end of Staten Land, bearing south 76 degrees east, distant four leagues. We were sheltered from the south wind by Staten Land, and from the north wind by the island. The other isles lay to the west and secured us from that wind. But, beside being open to the north-east and east, we also lay exposed to the north-northwest winds. This might have been avoided by anchoring more to the west, but I made choice of my situation for two reasons. First, to be near the island we intended to land upon, and secondly, to be able to get to sea with any wind. After dinner, we hoisted out three boats, and landed with a large party of men, some to kill seals, others to catch or kill birds, fish, or what came in our way. To find the former, it mattered not where we landed, for the whole shore was covered with them, and by the noise they made one would have thought the island was stocked with cows and calves. On landing we found they were a different animal from seals, but in shape and motion exactly resembling them. We called them lions on account of the great resemblance the male has to that beast. Here were also the same kind of seals which we found in New Zealand, generally known by the name of sea bears. At least we gave them that name. They were in general so tame or rather stupid as to suffer us to come near enough to knock them down with sticks but the large ones we shot, not thinking it safe to approach them. We also found on the island abundance of penguins and shags, and the latter had young ones almost fledged and just to our taste. Here were geese and ducks, but not many, birds of prey and a few small birds. In the evening we returned on board, our boats well laden with one thing or other. 1775 January. Next day being January the 1st, 1775, finding that nothing was wanting but a good harbour to make this a tolerable place for ships to refresh at, whom chance or design might bring hither, I sent Mr. Gilbert over to Staten Land in the cutter to look for one. Appearances promised success in a place opposite the ship, I also sent two other boats for the lions, etc. We had killed the preceding day, and soon after I went myself, and observed the sun's meridian altitude at the northeast end of the island, which gave the latitude 54 degrees 40 minutes 5 seconds south. After shooting a few geese, some other birds, and plentifully supplying ourselves with young shags, we returned on board, laden with sea lions, sea bears, etc. The old lions and bears were killed chiefly for the sake of their blubber, or fat, to make oil of, for, except their hazlets, which were tolerable, the flesh was too rank to be eaten with any degree of relish. But the young cubs were very palatable, and even the flesh of some of the old lionesses was not much amiss but that of the old males was abominable. In the afternoon I sent some people on shore to skin and cut off the fat of those which yet remained dead on shore, for we had already more carcasses on board than necessary, and I went myself in another boat to collect birds. About ten o'clock Mr. Gilbert returned from Statenland, where he found a good port, situated three leagues to the westward of Cape St. John, and in the direction of north a little easterly from the northeast end of the eastern island. It may be known by some small islands lying in the entrance. The channel which is on the east side of these islands is half a mile broad. The course is in southwest by south, turning gradually to west by south, and west. The harbour lies nearly in this last direction, is almost two miles in length, in some places near a mile broad, and hath in it from fifty to ten fathoms water, a bottom of mud and sand.
Its shores are covered with wood fit for fuel, and in it are several streams of fresh water. On the islands were sea lions, etc., and such an innumerable quantity of gulls as to darken the air when disturbed, and almost to suffocate our people with their dung. This they seemed to void in a way of defence, and it stunk worse than asafoetida, or what is commonly called devil's dung. Our people saw several geese, ducks, and racehorses, which is also a kind of duck. The day on which this port was discovered occasioned my calling it New Year's Harbour. It would be more convenient for ships bound to the west, or round Cape Horn, if its situation would permit them to put to sea with an easterly and northerly wind. This inconvenience, however, is of little consequence, since these winds are never known to be of long duration. The southerly and westerly are the prevailing winds, so that a ship never can be detained long in this port. As we could not sail in the morning of the second for want of wind, I sent a party of men on shore to the island, on the same duty as before. Towards noon we got a fresh breeze at west, but it came too late, and I resolved to wait till the next morning, when at four o'clock we weighed, with a fresh gale at northwest by west, and stood for Cape St. John, which at half past six bore north by east, distant four or five miles. This cape being the eastern point of Staten Land, a description of it is unnecessary. It may, however, not be amiss to say that it is a rock of a considerable height, situated in the latitude of 54 degrees 46 minutes south, longitude 63 degrees 47 minutes west, with a rocky islet lying close under the north part of it. To the westward of the cape, about five or six miles, is an inlet which seemed to divide the land, that is, to communicate with the sea to the south, and between this inlet and the cape is a bay, but I cannot say of what depth. In sailing round the cape, we met with a very strong current from the south. It made a race which looked like breakers, and it was as much as we could do with a strong gale to make head against it. After getting round the cape, I hauled up along the south coast, and as soon as we had brought the wind to blow off the land, it came upon us in such heavy squalls as obliged us to double reef our topsails. It afterwards fell by little and little, and at noon ended in a calm. At this time, Cape St. John bore north 20 degrees east, distant three and a half leagues. Cape St. Bartholomew, or the southwest point of Staten Land, south 83 degrees west. Two high detached rocks, north 80 degrees west, and the place where the land seemed to be divided, which had the same appearance on this side, bore north 15 degrees west, three leagues distant. Latitude observed 54 degrees 56 minutes. In this situation we sounded, but had no bottom with a line of 120 fathoms. The calm was of very short duration, a breeze presently springing up at northwest, but it was too faint to make head against the current, and we drove with it back to the north-northeast. At four o'clock the wind veered, and at once to south by east, and blew in squalls attended with rain. Two hours after, the squalls and rain subsided, and the wind returning back to the west blew a gentle gale. All this time, the current set us to the north, so that at eight o'clock, Cape St. John bore west-northwest, distant about seven leagues. I now gave over plying and steered southeast with the resolution to leave the land, judging it to be sufficiently explored to answer the most general purposes of navigation and geography. End of section 17.
Section 18 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 4 Observations Geographical and Nautical with an account of the islands near Staten Land and the animals found in them. 1775, January The annexed chart will very accurately show the direction, extent and position of the coast along which I have sailed either in this or my former voyage. The latitudes have been determined by the sun's meridian altitude, which we were so fortunate as to obtain every day, except the one we sailed from Christmas Sound, which was of no consequence, as its latitude was known before. The longitudes have been settled by lunar observations, as is already mentioned. I have taken 67 degrees 46 minutes for the longitude of Cape Horn. From this meridian, the longitudes of all the other parts are deduced by the watch, by which the extent of the whole must be determined to a few miles, and whatever errors there may be in longitude must be general. But I think it highly probable that the longitude is determined to within a quarter of a degree. Thus the extent of Terra del Fuego from east to west, and consequently that of the Straits of Magalhães, will be found less than most navigators have made it. In order to illustrate this and to show the situations of the neighbouring islands, and, by this means, make the chart of more general use, I have extended it down to 47 degrees of latitude, but I am only answerable for the accuracy of such parts as I have explored myself. In laying down the rest, I had recourse to the following authorities. The longitude of Cape Virgin Mary, which is the most essential point, as it determines the length of the Straits of Magalhães, is deduced from Lord Anson, who made 2 degrees 30 minutes difference of longitude between it and the Strait Le Maire. Now, as the latter lies in 65 degrees 22 minutes, Cape Virgin Mary must lie in 67 degrees 52 minutes, which is the longitude I have assigned to it, and which I have reason to think cannot be far from the truth. The Strait of Magalhães and the east coast of Patagonia are laid down from the observations made by the late English and French navigators. The position of the west coast of America from Cape Victory northward I have taken from the discoveries of Sarmiento, a Spanish navigator communicated to me by Mr. Stewart, F.R.S., Falkland Islands are copied from a sketch taken from Captain McBride, who circumnavigated them some years ago in His Majesty's ship Jason, and their distance from the main is agreeable to the run of the Dolphin, under the command of Commodore Byron, from Cape Virgin Mary to Port Egmont, and from Port Egmont to Port Desire both of which runs were made in a few days. Consequently, no material errors could happen. The southwest coast of Terra del Fuego, with respect to inlets, islands, etc., may be compared to the coast of Norway, for I doubt if there be an extent of three leagues where there is not an inlet or harbour which will receive and shelter the largest shipping. The worst is that till these inlets are better known, one has, as it were, to fish for anchorage. 
There are several lurking rocks on the coast, but happily none of them lie far from land, the approach to which may be known by sounding, supposing the weather so obscure that you cannot see it. For to judge of the whole by the parts we have sounded, it is more than probable that there are soundings all along the coast, and for several leagues out to sea. Upon the whole, this is by no means the dangerous coast it has been represented. Staten land lies east by north and west by south, and is ten leagues long in that direction, and nowhere above three or four leagues broad. The coast is rocky, much indented, and seem to form several bays or inlets. It shows a surface of craggy hills, which spire up to a vast height, especially near the west end. Except the craggy summits of the hills, the greatest part was covered with trees and shrubs, or some sort of herbage, and there was little or no snow on it. The currents between Cape de Seda and Cape Horn set from west to east, that is, in the same direction as the coast, but they are by no means considerable. To the east of the Cape their strength is much increased, and their direction is northeast towards Staten Land. They are rapid in Strait La Mer and along the south coast of Staten Land, and set like a torrent round Cape St. John, where they take a northwest direction and continue to run very strong, both within and without New Year's Isles. While we lay at anchor within this island, I observed that the current was strongest during the flood, and that on the ebb its strength was so much impaired that the ship would sometimes ride head to the wind when it was at west and west-northwest. This is only to be understood of the place where the ship lay at anchor, for at the very time we had a strong current setting to the westward, Mr. Gilbert found one of equal strength near the coast of Staten Land, setting to the eastward, though probably this was an eddy current or tide. If the tides are regulated by the moon, it is high water by the shore, at this place, on the days of the new and full moon, about four o'clock. The perpendicular rise and fall is very inconsiderable, not exceeding four feet at most. In Christmas Sound, it is high water at half past two o'clock on the days of the full and change, and Mr. Wales observed it to rise and fall on a perpendicular three feet six inches, but this was during the neap tides, consequently the spring tides must rise higher. To give such an account of the tides and currents on these coasts as navigators might depend on, would require a multitude of observations, and in different places, the making of which would be a work of time. I confess myself unprovided with materials for such a task, and believe that the less I say on this subject, the fewer mistakes I shall make. But I think I have been able to observe that in Strait La Mer, the southerly tide or current, be it flood or ebb, begins to act on the days of new and full moon about four o'clock, which remark may be of use to ships who pass the strait. Were I bound round Cape Horn to the west and not in want of wood or water or any other thing that might make it necessary to put into port, I would not come near the land at all, for by keeping out to sea you avoid the currents which, I am satisfied, lose their force at ten or twelve leagues from land, and at a greater distance there is none. During the time we were upon the coast we had more calms than storms, and the winds so variable that I question if a passage might not have been made from east to west in as short a time as from west to east, nor did we experience any cold weather. The mercury in the thermometer at noon 
was never below 46 degrees, and while we lay in Christmas Sound, it was generally above temperate. At this place, the variation was 23 degrees 30 minutes east. A few leagues to the southwest of Strait Le Maire, it was 24 degrees, and at anchor, within New Year's Isles, it was 24 degrees 20 minutes east. These isles are in general so unlike Staten Land, especially the one on which we landed, that it deserves a particular description. It shows a surface of equal height and elevated about 30 or 40 feet above the sea, from which it is defended by a rocky coast. The inner part of the isle is covered with a sort of sword grass, very green and of a great length. It grows on little hillocks of two or three feet in diameter, and as many or more in height, in large tufts which seem to be composed of the roots of the plant matted together. Among these hillocks are a vast number of paths made by sea bears and penguins, by which they retire into the centre of the isle. It is, nevertheless, exceedingly bad travelling, for these paths are so dirty that one is sometimes up to the knees in mire. Besides this plant, there are a few other grasses, a kind of heath and some celery. The whole surface is moist and wet, and on the coast are several small streams of water. The sword grass, as I call it, appears to be the same that grows in Falkland Isles, described by Bougainville as a kind of gladiolus, or rather a species of gramen. Footnote. See English translation of Bougainville, page 51. End footnote. And named by Panetti, corn flags. The animals found on this little spot are sea lions, sea bears, a variety of oceanic and some land birds. The sea lion is pretty well described by Panetti, though those we saw here have not such forefeet or fins as that he has given a plate of, but such fins as that which he calls the sea wolf. Nor did we see any of the size he speaks of, the largest not being more than 12 or 14 feet in length, and perhaps 8 or 10 in circumference. They are not of that kind described under the same name by Lord Anson, but for aught I know, these would more properly deserve that appellation. The long hair with which the back of the head, the neck and shoulders are covered, giving them greatly the air and appearance of a lion. The other part of the body is covered with short hair, little longer than that of a cow or horse and the whole is a dark brown. The female is not half so big as the male, and is covered with a short hair of an ash or light dun colour. They live, as it were, in herds on the rocks and near the seashore. As this was the time for engendering, as well as bringing forth their young, we have seen a male with twenty or thirty females about him, and always very attentive to keep them all to himself, and beating off every other male who attempted to come into his flock. Others again have a less number, some no more than one or two, and here and there we have seen one lying growling in a retired place alone, and suffering neither males nor females to approach him, we judged these were old and superannuated. The sea bears are not so large by far as the lions, but rather larger than a common seal. They have none of that long hair which distinguishes the lion. Theirs is all of an equal length and finer than that of a lion, something like an otter's, and the general colour is that of an iron grey. This is the kind which the French call sea wolves and the English seals. They are, however, different from the seals we have in Europe and North America. 
The lions may too, without any great impropriety, be called overgrown seals, for they are all of the same species. It was not at all dangerous to go among them, for they either fled or lay still. The only danger was in going between them and the sea, for if they took fright at anything, they would come down in such numbers that, if you could not get out of their way, you would be run over. Sometimes when we came suddenly upon them, or waked them out of their sleep, for they are a sluggish, sleepy animal, they would raise up their heads, snort and snarl, and look as fierce as if they meant to devour us. But as we advanced upon them, they always run away, so that they are downright bullies. The penguin is an amphibious bird so well known to most people that I shall only observe they are here in prodigious numbers, so that we could knock down as many as we pleased with a stick. I cannot say they are good eating. I have indeed made several good meals of them, but it was for want of better victuals. They either do not breed here, or else this was not the season, for we saw neither eggs nor young ones. Shags breed here in vast numbers, and we carried on board not a few, as they are very good eating. They take certain spots to themselves, and build their nests near the edge of the cliffs on little hillocks, which are either those of the sword grass, or else they are made by the shags building on them from year to year. There is another sort rather smaller than these, which breed in the cliffs of rocks. The geese are of the same sort we found in Christmas Sound. We saw but few, and some had young ones. Mr. Forster shot one, which was different from these, being larger, with a grey plumage and black feet. The others make a noise exactly like a duck. Here were ducks, but not many, and several of that sort which we called racehorses. We shot some and found them to weigh twenty-nine or thirty pounds. Those who eat of them said they were very good. The oceanic birds were gulls, terns, Port Egmont hens, and a large brown bird of the size of an albatross, which Panetti calls Quebranta hosus. We call them Mother Carey's goose and found them pretty good eating. The land birds were eagles or hawks, bald-headed vultures, or what our seamen called turkey buzzards, thrushes, and a few small birds. Our naturalists found two new species of birds. The one is about the size of a pigeon, the plumage as white as milk. They feed along shore, probably on shellfish and carrion, for they have a very disagreeable smell. When we first saw these birds, we thought they were the snow petrel, but the moment they were in our possession, the mistake was discovered, for they resemble them in nothing but size and colour. These are not webbed-footed. The other sort is a species of curlews, nearly as big as a heron. It has a variegated plumage, the principal colours whereof are light grey and a long crooked bill. I had almost forgot to mention that there are sea pies, or what we called when in New Zealand curlews, but we saw only a few straggling pairs. It may not be amiss to observe that the shags are the same bird which Bougainville calls sawbills, but he is mistaken in saying that the Quibranta houses are their enemies, for this bird is of the petrel tribe, feeds wholly on fish, and is to be found in all the high southern latitudes. It is amazing to see how the different animals which inhabit this little spot are mutually reconciled. They seem to have entered into a league not to disturb each other's tranquillity. The sea lions occupy most of the sea coast. The sea bears take up their abode in the isle. The shags have post in the highest cliffs. 
the penguins fix their quarters where there is the most easy communication to and from the sea, and the other birds choose more retired places. We have seen all these animals mixed together, like domestic cattle and poultry in a farmyard, without one attempting to molest the other. Nay, I have often observed the eagles and vultures sitting on the hillocks among the shags, without the latter, either young or old, being disturbed at their presence. It may be asked how these birds of prey live. I suppose on the carcasses of seals and birds, which die by various causes, and probably not few, as they are so numerous. This very imperfect account is written more with a view to assist my own memory than to give information to others. I am neither a botanist nor a naturalist, and have not words to describe the productions of nature, either in the one branch of knowledge or the other. End of section 18. Section 19 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book Four, Chapter Five, Proceedings After Leaving Staten Island, with an account of the discovery of the Isle of Georgia, and a description of it, seventeen seventy five, January, having left the land in the evening of the third, as before mentioned, we saw it again next morning at three o'clock, bearing west. Wind continued to blow a steady fresh breeze till 6 p.m., when it shifted to a heavy squall to southwest, which came so suddenly upon us that we had not time to take in the sails, and was the occasion of carrying away a top-gallant mast, a studding sail boom, and a fore studding sail. The squall ended in a heavy shower of rain, but the wind remained at southwest. Our course was southeast, with a view of discovering that extensive coast laid down by Mr. Dalrymple in his chart, in which is the Gulf of St. Sebastian. I designed to make the western point of that gulf, in order to have all the other parts before me. Indeed, I had some doubt of the existence of such a coast, and this appeared to me the best route for clearing it up and for exploring the southern part of this ocean. On the fifth, fresh gales and wet and cloudy weather. At noon, observed in 59 degrees 9 minutes, latitude made from Cape St. John, 5 degrees 2 minutes east. At 6 o'clock p.m., being in the latitude of 57 degrees 21 minutes, and in longitude 57 degrees 45 minutes west, the variation was 21 degrees, 28 minutes east. At 8 o'clock in the evening of the 6th, being then in the latitude of 58 degrees, 9 minutes south, longitude 53 degrees, 14 minutes west, we close reefed our topsails and hauled to the north with a very strong gale at west, attended with a thick haze and sleet. The situation just mentioned is nearly the same that Mr. Dalrymple assigns for the southwest point of the Gulf of St. Sebastian. But as we saw neither land nor signs of land, I was the more doubtful of its existence, and was fearful that, by keeping to the south, I might miss the land said to be discovered by La Roche in 1675, and by the ship Lion in 1756, which Mr. Dalrymple places in 54 degrees 30 minutes latitude, 
and 45 degrees of longitude. But on looking over Danville's chart, I found it laid down 9 degrees or 10 degrees more to the west, this difference of situation being to me a sign of the uncertainty of both accounts determined me to get into the parallel as soon as possible and was the reason of my hauling to the north at this time. Towards the morning of the 7th, the gale abated, the weather cleared up and the wind veered to the west-southwest where it continued till midnight after which it veered to northwest. Being at this time in the latitude of 56 degrees 4 minutes south, longitude 53 degrees 36 minutes west, we sounded, but found no bottom with a line of 130 fathoms. I still kept the wind on the larboard tack, having a gentle breeze and pleasant weather. On the 8th at noon, a bed of seaweed passed the ship. In the afternoon, in latitude 55 degrees 4 minutes, longitude 51 degrees 43 minutes west, the variation was 20 degrees 4 minutes east. On the 9th, wind at northeast attended with thick hazy weather, saw a seal and a piece of seaweed. At noon, latitude 55 degrees 12 minutes south, longitude 50 degrees 15 minutes west, the wind and weather continuing the same till towards midnight, when the latter cleared up and the former veered to west and blew a gentle gale. We continued to ply till two o'clock the next morning, when we bore away east and at eight east-northeast. At noon observed in latitude 54 degrees 35 minutes south, longitude 47 degrees 56 minutes west, a great many albatrosses and blue petrels about the ship. I now steered east and the next morning in the latitude of 54 degrees 38 minutes, longitude 45 degrees 10 minutes west, the variation was 19 degrees 25 minutes east. In the afternoon saw several penguins and some pieces of wood. Having spent the night lying too, on the 12th, at daybreak, we bore away and steered east-northerly with a fine fresh breeze at west-southwest. At noon, observed in latitude 54 degrees 28 minutes south, longitude in 42 degrees 8 minutes west. That is nearly 3 degrees east of the situation in which Mr. Dalrymple places the northeast point of the Gulf of St. Sebastian but we had no other signs of land than seeing a seal and a few penguins. On the contrary, we had a swell from east-south-east, which would hardly have been if any extensive track of land lay in that direction. In the evening the gale abated, and at midnight it fell calm. The calm, attended by a thick fog, continued till six next morning, when we got a wind at east, but the fog still prevailed. We stood to the south till noon, when, being in the latitude of 55 degrees 7 minutes, we tacked and stretched to the north, with a fresh breeze at east by south and east southeast, cloudy weather saw several penguins and a snow petrel, which we looked on to be signs of the vicinity of ice. The air, too, was much colder than we had felt it since we left New Zealand. In the afternoon the wind veered to the southeast, and in the night to south-southeast, and blew fresh, with which we stood to the northeast. At nine o'clock the next morning we saw an island of ice, as we then thought, but at noon were doubtful whether it was ice or land. At this time it bore east three-quarters south, distant thirteen leagues. Our latitude was fifty-three degrees, fifty-six and a half minutes, longitude thirty-nine degrees, twenty-four minutes west. Several penguins, small divers, a snow petrel, 
and a vast number of blue petrels about the ship. We had but little wind all the morning, and at 2 p.m. it fell calm. It was now no longer doubted that it was land and not ice, which we had in sight. It was, however, in a manner wholly covered with snow. We were farther confirmed in our judgment of its being land by finding soundings at 175 fathoms, a muddy bottom. The land at this time bore east by south, about 12 leagues distant. At six o'clock, the calm was succeeded by a breeze at northeast, with which we stood to southeast. At first, it blew a gentle gale, but afterwards increased so as to bring us under double reefed topsails and was attended with snow and sleet. We continued to stand to the southeast till seven in the morning on the 15th, when the wind veering to the southeast, we tacked and stood to the north. A little before we tacked, we saw the land bearing east by north. At noon, the mercury in the thermometer was at 35 and a quarter degrees. The wind blew in squalls, attended with snow and sleet, and we had a great sea to encounter. At a lee lurch which the ship took, Mr. Wales observed her to lie down 42 degrees. At half past 4 p.m., we took in the topsails, got down top gallant yards, wore the ship, and stood to the southwest under two courses. At midnight, the storm abated so that we could carry the topsails double reefed. At four in the morning of the 16th, we wore and stood to the east with the wind at south southeast a moderate breeze and fair. At eight o'clock saw the land extending from east by north to northeast by north, loosed a reef out of each topsail, got topgallant yards across, and set the sails. At noon observed in latitude 54 degrees, 25 and a half minutes, longitude 38 degrees, 18 minutes west. In this situation, we had 110 fathoms water, and the land extended from north a half west to east, eight leagues distant. The northern extreme was the same that we first discovered, and it proved to be an island, which obtained the name of Willis's Island, after the person who first saw it. At this time, we had a great swell from the south, an indication that no land was near us in that direction. Nevertheless, the vast quantity of snow on that in sight induced us to think it was extensive, and I chose to begin with exploring the northern coast. With this view, we bore up for Willis's Island, all sail set, having a fine gale at south-southwest. As we advanced to the north, we perceived another isle lying east of Willis's and between it and the main. Seeing there was a clear passage between the two isles, we steered for it, and at five o'clock, being in the middle of it, we found it about two miles broad. Willis's isle is an high rock of no great extent, near to which are some rocky islets. It is situated in the latitude of 54 degrees south, longitude 38 degrees 23 minutes west. The other isle, which obtained the name of Bird Isle, on account of the vast number that were upon it, is not so high, but is of greater extent, and is close to the northeast point of the mainland, which I called Cape North. The southeast coast of this land as far as we saw it, lies in the direction of south 50 degrees east and north 50 degrees west. It seemed to form several bays or inlets, and we observed huge masses of snow or ice in the bottoms of them, especially in one which lies 10 miles to the south-southeast of Bird Island. After getting through the passage, we found the north coast trended east by north 
for about nine miles, and then east and east southerly to Cape Buller, which is 11 miles more. We ranged the coast at one league distance till near 10 o'clock, when we brought to for the night, and on sounding found 50 fathoms a muddy bottom. At two o'clock in the morning of the 17th, we made sail in for the land with a fine breeze at southwest. At four, Willis's Isle bore west by south, distant 32 miles, Cape Buller, to the west of which lie some rocky islets, bore southwest by west, and at the most advanced point of land to the east, south 63 degrees east. We now steered along shore at the distance of four or five miles till seven o'clock when, seeing the appearance of an inlet, we hauled in for it. As soon as we drew near the shore, having hoisted out a boat, I embarked in it, accompanied by Mr. Forster and his party, with a view of reconnoitring the bay before we ventured in with the ship. When we put off from her, which was about four miles from the shore, we had forty fathoms water. I continued to sound as I went farther in, but found no bottom with a line of thirty-four fathoms, which was the length of that I had in the boat, and which also proved too short to sound the bay, so far as I went up it. I observed it to lie in southwest by south about two leagues, about two miles broad, well sheltered from all winds, and I judged there might be good anchorage before some sandy beaches which are on each side, and likewise near a low flat isle towards the head of the bay. As I had come to a resolution not to bring the ship in, I did not think it worth my while to go and examine these places, for it did not seem probable that any one would ever be benefited by the discovery. I landed at three different places, displayed our colours, and took possession of the country in His Majesty's name under a discharge of small arms. I judged that the tide rises about four or five feet, and that it is high water on the full and change days, about eleven o'clock. The head of the bay, as well as two places on each side, was terminated by perpendicular ice cliffs of considerable height. Pieces were continually breaking off and floating out to sea, and a great fall happened while we were in the bay which made a noise like cannon. The inner parts of the country were not less savage and horrible. The wild rocks raised their lofty summits till they were lost in the clouds, and the valleys lay covered with everlasting snow. Not a tree was to be seen, nor a shrub even big enough to make a toothpick. The only vegetation we met with was a coarse, strong-bladed grass growing in tufts, wild burnet, and a plant-like moss which sprang from the rocks. Seals or sea bears were pretty numerous. They were smaller than those at Statenland. Perhaps the most of them we saw were females, for the shores swarmed with young cubs. We saw none of that sort which we call lions, but there were some of those which the writer of Lord Anson's voyage describes under that name. At least they appeared to us to be of the same sort, and are, in my opinion, very improperly called lions, for I could not see any grounds for the comparison. Here were several flocks of penguins, the largest I ever saw. Some which we brought on board weighed from 29 to 38 pounds. It appears by Bougainville's account of the animals of Falkland Islands, that this penguin is there, and I think it is very well described by him under the name of First Class of Penguins. Footnote. See Bougainville, English translation, page 64. End footnote. The oceanic birds were albatrosses, common gulls, and that sort which I call Port Egmont hens, 
terns, shags, divers, the new white bird, and a small bird like those of the Cape of Good Hope, called yellow birds, which, having shot two, we found most delicious food. All the land birds we saw consisted of a few small larks, nor did we meet with any quadrupeds. Mr. Forster indeed observed some dung, which he judged to come from a fox or some such animal. The lands, or rather rocks, bordering on the sea coast, were not covered with snow like the inland parts, but all the vegetation we could see on the clear places was the grass above mentioned. The rocks seemed to contain iron. Having made the above observations, we set out for the ship and got on board a little after twelve o'clock with a quantity of seals and penguins, an acceptable present to the crew. It must not, however, be understood that we were in want of provisions. We had yet plenty of every kind and since we had been on this coast, I had ordered, in addition to the common allowance, wheat to be boiled every morning for breakfast, but any kind of fresh meat was preferred by most on board to salt. For my own part, I was now for the first time heartily tired of salt meat of every kind, and though the flesh of the penguins could scarcely vie with bullock's liver, its being fresh was sufficient to make it go down. I called the bay we had been in Possession Bay. It is situated in the latitude of 54 degrees 5 minutes south, longitude 37 degrees 18 minutes west, and 11 leagues to the east of Cape North. A few miles to the west of Possession Bay, between it and Cape Buller, lies the Bay of Isles so named on account of several small isles lying in and before it. As soon as the boat was hoisted in, we made sail along the coast to the east with a fine breeze at west-south-west. From Cape Buller, the direction of the coast is south, 72 degrees 30 minutes east, for the space of 11 or 12 leagues, to a projecting point, which obtained the name of Cape Saunders. Beyond this cape is a pretty large bay, which I named Cumberland Bay. In several parts in the bottom of it, as also in some others of less extent, lying between Cape Saunders and Possession Bay, were vast tracts of frozen snow or ice not yet broken loose. At eight o'clock, being just past Cumberland Bay, and falling little wind, we hauled off the coast, from which we were distant about four miles, and found 110 fathoms water. We had variable light airs and calms till six o'clock the next morning, when the wind fixed at north and blew a gentle breeze, but it lasted no longer than ten o'clock, when it fell almost to a calm. At noon, observed in latitude 54 degrees 30 minutes south, being then about two or three leagues from the coast, which extended from north 59 degrees west to south 13 degrees west. The land in this last direction was an isle, which seemed to be the extremity of the coast to the east, the nearest land to us being a projecting point which terminated in a round hillock was, on account of the day, named Cape Charlotte. On the west side of Cape Charlotte lies a bay which obtained the name of Royal Bay, and the west point of it was named Cape George. It is the east point of Cumberland Bay, and lies in the direction of southeast by east from Cape Saunders, distant seven leagues. Cape George and Cape Charlotte lie in the direction of south 37 degrees east and north 37 degrees west, distant six leagues from each other. The isle above mentioned, which was called Cooper's Isle, after my first lieutenant, lies in the direction of south by east, distant eight leagues from Cape Charlotte. The coast between them forms a large bay, 
to which I gave the name of Sandwich. The wind being variable all the afternoon, we advanced but little. In the night it fixed at south and south-southwest, and blew a gentle gale, attended with showers of snow. The nineteenth was wholly spent in plying, the wind continuing at south and south-southwest, clear pleasant weather but cold. At sunrise a new land was seen, bearing southeast to half-east. It first appeared in a single hill, like a sugar loaf. Some time after other detached pieces appeared above the horizon near the hill. At noon, observed in the latitude of 54 degrees, 42 minutes, 30 seconds south, Cape Charlotte bearing north 38 degrees west, distant four leagues, and Cooper's Isle south 31 degrees west. In this situation, a lurking rock, which lies off Sandwich Bay, five miles from the land, bore west a half north, distant one mile, and near this rock were several breakers. In the afternoon we had a prospect of a ridge of mountains behind Sandwich Bay, whose lofty and icy summits were elevated high above the clouds. The wind continued at south-southwest till six o'clock, when it fell to a calm. At this time Cape Charlotte bore north 31 degrees west, and Cooper's Isle west-southwest. In this situation we found the variation by the azimuths to be 11 degrees 39 minutes, and by the amplitude 11 degrees 12 minutes east. At 10 o'clock, a light breeze springing up at north, we steered to the south till 12, and then brought to for the night. At 2 o'clock in the morning of the 20th, we made sail to southwest round Cooper's Island. It is a rock of considerable height, about 5 miles in circuit, and one mile from the main. At this isle, the main coast takes a southwest direction for the space of four or five leagues to a point, which I called Cape Disappointment. Off that are three small isles, the southernmost of which is green, low and flat, and lies one league from the Cape. As we advanced to southwest, land opened off this point, in the direction of north 60 degrees west and nine leagues beyond it. It proved an island quite detached from the main and obtained the name of Pickersgill Island after my third officer. Soon after a point of the main beyond this island came into sight in the direction of north 55 degrees west, which exactly united the coast at the very point we had seen, and taken the bearing of, the day we first came in with it, and proved to a demonstration that this land, which we had taken for part of a great continent, was no more than an island of seventy leagues in circuit. Who would have thought that an island of no greater extent than this, situated between the latitude of 54 and 55 degrees, should, in the very height of summer, be in a manner wholly covered many fathoms deep with frozen snow, but more especially the southwest coast. The very sides and craggy summits of the lofty mountains were cased with snow and ice, but the quantity which lay in the valleys is incredible and at the bottom of the bays the coast was terminated by a wall of ice of considerable height. It can hardly be doubted that a great deal of ice is formed here in the water, which in the spring is broken off and dispersed over the sea. But this island cannot produce the ten thousandth part of what we saw, so that either there must be more land, or the ice is formed without it, these reflections led me to think that the land we had seen the preceding day might belong to an extensive track, and I still had hopes of discovering a continent. 
I must confess the disappointment I now met with did not affect me much, for, to judge of the bulk by the sample, it would not be worth the discovery. I called this island the Isle of Georgia, in honour of His Majesty. It is situated between the latitudes of 53 degrees 57 minutes and 54 degrees 57 minutes south, and between 38 degrees 13 minutes and 35 degrees 34 minutes west longitude. It extends southeast by east and northwest by west, and is 31 leagues long in that direction, and its greatest breadth is about 10 leagues. It seems to abound with bays and harbours, the northeast coast especially, but the vast quantity of ice must render them inaccessible the greatest part of the year, or at least it must be dangerous lying in them on account of the breaking up of the ice cliffs. It is remarkable that we did not see a river or stream of fresh water on the whole coast. I think it highly probable that there are no perennial springs in the country, and that the interior parts, as being much elevated, never enjoy heat enough to melt the snow in such quantities as to produce a river or stream of water. The coast alone receives warmth sufficient to melt the snow, and this only on the northeast side. For the other, besides being exposed to the cold south winds, is, to a great extent, deprived of the sun's rays by the uncommon height of the mountains. It was from a persuasion that the sea coast of a land situated in the latitude of 54 degrees could not, in the very height of summer, be wholly covered with snow, that I supposed Bouvet's discovery to be large islands of ice. But after I had seen this land, I no longer hesitated about the existence of Cape Circumcision, nor did I doubt that I should find more land than I should have time to explore. With these ideas, I quitted this coast and directed my course to the east-southeast for the land we had seen the preceding day. The wind was very variable till noon, when it fixed at north-north-east and blew a gentle gale, but it increased in such a manner that, before three o'clock, we were reduced to our two courses and obliged to strike top-gallant yards. We were very fortunate in getting clear of the land before this gale overtook us, it being hard to say what might have been the consequence had it come on while we were on the north coast. This storm was of short duration, for at eight o'clock it began to abate, and at midnight it was little wind. We then took the opportunity to sound, but found no bottom with a line of an 180 fathoms. Next day the storm was succeeded by a thick fog attended with rain. The wind veered to northwest, and at five in the morning it fell calm, which continued till eight, and then we got a breeze southerly, with which we stood to the east till three in the afternoon. The weather then coming somewhat clear, we made sail and steered north in search of land, but at half past six we were again involved in a thick mist, which made it necessary to haul the wind and spend the night in making short boards. We had variable light airs next to a calm and thick foggy weather till half past seven o'clock in the evening of the 22nd, when we got a fine breeze at north, and the weather was so clear that we could see two or three leagues round us. We seized the opportunity and steered to west, judging we were to the east of the land. After running ten miles to the west, the weather again became foggy, and we hauled the wind and spent the night under topsails. Next morning at six o'clock, the fog clearing away so that we could see three or four miles, I took the opportunity to steer again to the west, with the wind at east a fresh breeze, but two hours after, a thick fog once more obliged us to haul the wind to the south. 
At eleven o'clock, a short interval of clear weather gave us view of three or four rocky islets extending from southeast to east northeast, two or three miles distant, but we did not see the Sugarloaf Peak before mentioned. Indeed, two or three miles was the extent of our horizon. We were well assured that this was the land we had seen before, which we had now been quite round, and therefore it could be no more than a few detached rocks, receptacles for birds, of which we now saw vast numbers, especially shags, who gave us notice of the vicinity of land before we saw it. These rocks lie in the latitude of 55 degrees south and south 75 degrees east, distant 12 leagues from Cooper's Isle. The interval of clear weather was of very short duration, before we had as thick a fog as ever, attended with rain, on which we tacked in 60 fathoms water and stood to the north. Thus we spent our time involved in a continual thick mist, and for aught we knew, surrounded by dangerous rocks. The shags and soundings were our best pilots, for after we had stood a few miles to the north, we got out of soundings and saw no more shags. The succeeding day and night we spent in making short boards, and at eight o'clock on the 24th, judging ourselves not far from the rocks, by some straggling shags which came about us, we sounded in sixty fathoms water, the bottom stones and broken shells. Soon after we saw the rocks bearing south-southwest or half-west, four miles distant, but still we did not see the peak. It was, no doubt, beyond our horizon, which was limited to a short distance, and indeed we had but a transient sight of the other rocks, before they were again lost in the fog. With a light air of wind at north and a great swell from northeast, we were able to clear the rocks to the west, and at four in the p.m., judging ourselves to be three or four leagues east and west of them, I steered south, being quite tired with cruising about them in a thick fog, nor was it worth my while to spend any more time in waiting for clear weather, only for the sake of having a good sight of a few straggling rocks. At seven o'clock we had at intervals a clear sky to the west, which gave us a sight of the mountains of the Isle of Georgia, bearing west-northwest, about eight leagues distant. At eight o'clock we steered southeast by south, and at ten southeast by east, with a fresh breeze at north, attended with a very thick fog. But we were, in some measure, acquainted with the sea over which we were running. The rocks above mentioned obtained the name of Clark's Rocks, after my second officer, he being the first who saw them. End of section 19 Section 20 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 6. Proceedings after leaving the Isle of Georgia with an account of the discovery of Sandwich Land, with some reasons for there being land about the South Pole. 1775, January. On the 25th, we steered east-south-east with a fresh gale at north-northeast, attended with foggy weather, till towards the evening when, the sky becoming clear, we found the variation to be 9 degrees 26 minutes east, being at this time in the latitude of 56 degrees 16 minutes south, longitude 32 degrees 9 minutes west. 
having continued to steer east south east with a fine gale at north north west till daylight next morning on seeing no land to the east i gave orders to steer south being at this time in the latitude of fifty six degrees thirty three minutes south longitude thirty one degrees ten minutes west the weather continued clear and gave us an opportunity to observe several distances of the sun and moon for the correcting our longitude which at noon was thirty one degrees four minutes west the latitude observed fifty seven degrees thirty eight minutes south we continued to steer to the south till the twenty seventh at noon at which time we were in the latitude of fifty nine degrees forty six minutes south and had so thick a fog that we could not see a ship's length it being no longer safe to sail before the wind as we were to expect soon to fall in with ice i therefore hauled to the east having a gentle breeze at north north east soon after the fog clearing away we resumed our course to the south till four o'clock when it returned again as thick as ever and made it necessary for us to haul upon a wind i now reckoned we were in latitude sixty degrees south and farther i did not intend to go unless i observed some certain signs of soon meeting with land for it would not have been prudent in me to have spent my time in penetrating to the south when it was at least as probable that a large tract of land might be found near cape circumcision besides i was tired of these high southern latitudes where nothing was to be found but ice and thick fogs we had now a long hollow swell from the west a strong indication that there was no land in that direction so that i think i may venture to assert that the extensive coast laid down in mr dalrymple's chart of the ocean between africa and america and the gulf of st sebastian do not exist at seven o'clock in the evening the fog receding from us a little gave us a sight of an ice island several penguins and some snow petrels we sounded but found no ground at one hundred and forty fathoms the fog soon returning we spent the night in making boards over that space which we had in some degree made ourselves acquainted with in the day at eight in the morning of the twenty eighth we stood to the east with a gentle gale at north the weather began to clear up and we found the sea strewed with large and small ice several penguins snow petrels and other birds were seen and some whales soon after we had sunshine but the air was cold the mercury in the thermometer stood generally at thirty five but at noon it was thirty seven degrees the latitude by observation was sixty degrees four minutes south longitude twenty nine degrees twenty three minutes west we continued to stand to the east till half past two o'clock p m when we fell in all at once with a vast number of large ice islands and a sea strewed with loose ice the weather too was becoming thick and hazy attended with drizzling rain and sleet which made it the more dangerous to stand in among the ice for this reason we tacked and stood back to the west with the wind at north the ice islands which at this time surrounded us were nearly all of equal height and showed a flat even surface but they were of various extent some being two or three miles in circuit the loose ice was what had broken from these isles next morning the wind falling and veering to south-west we steered north-east but this course was soon intercepted by numerous ice islands and having but very little wind we were obliged to steer such courses as carried us the clearest of them so that we hardly made any advance one way or another during the whole day 
Abundance of whales and penguins were about us all the time, and the weather fair but dark and gloomy. At midnight the wind began to freshen at north-north-east, with which we stood to the north-west till six in the morning of the thirtieth, when the wind veering to north-northwest we tacked and stood to north-east, and soon after sailed through a good deal of loose ice, and passed two large islands. Except a short interval of clear weather about nine o'clock, it was continually foggy, with either sleet or snow. At noon we were, by our reckoning, in the latitude of 59 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 29 degrees 24 minutes west. Continuing to stand to northeast with a fresh breeze at north-northwest, at two o'clock we passed one of the largest ice islands we had seen in the voyage, and some time after passed two others, which were much smaller, weather still foggy with sleet, and the wind continued at north by west, with which we stood to northeast over a sea strewed with ice. At half past six next morning, as we were standing north northeast with the wind at west, the fog very fortunately clearing away a little, we discovered land ahead, three or four miles distant. On this we hauled the wind to the north, but finding we could not weather the land on this tack, we soon after tacked in 175 fathoms water, three miles from the shore, and about half a league from some breakers. The weather then cleared up a little more, and gave us a tolerably good sight of the land. That which we had fallen in with proved three rocky islets of considerable height. The outermost terminated in a lofty peak like a sugar loaf, and obtained the name of Friesland Peak, after the man who first discovered it. Latitude 59 degrees south, longitude 27 degrees west. Behind this peak, that is to the east of it, appeared an elevated coast whose lofty snow-clad summits were seen above the clouds. It extended from north by east to east-south-east, and I called it Cape Bristol, in honour of the noble family of Harvey. At the same time, another elevated coast appeared in sight, bearing southwest by south, and at noon it extended from southeast to south-southwest, from four to eight leagues distant. At this time the observed latitude was 59 degrees, 13 minutes, 30 seconds south, longitude 27 degrees, 45 minutes west. I called this land Southern Thule because it is the most southern land that has ever yet been discovered. It shows a surface of vast height and is everywhere covered with snow. Some thought they saw land in the space between Thule and Cape Bristol. It is more than probable that these two lands are connected and that this space is a deep bay which I called Forster's Bay. At one o'clock, finding that we could not weather Thule, we tacked and stood to the north, and at four, Friesland Peak bore east, distant three or four leagues. Soon after, it fell little wind, and we were left to the mercy of a great westerly swell, which set right upon the shore. We sounded, but a line of two hundred fathoms found no bottom. At eight o'clock, the weather, which had been very hazy, clearing up, we saw Crape Bristol bearing east-south-east and terminating in a point to the north, beyond which we could see no land. This discovery relieved us from the fear of being carried by the swell on the most horrible coast in the world, and we continued to stand to the north all night with a light breeze at west. 1775 February. On the 1st of February, at four o'clock in the morning, we got sight of a new coast, which at six o'clock bore north 60 degrees east. It proved a high promontory, which I named Cape Montague, 
situated in latitude 58 degrees 27 minutes south, longitude 26 degrees 44 minutes west, and seven or eight leagues to the north of Cape Bristol. We saw land from space to space between them, which made me conclude that the whole was connected. I was sorry I could not determine this with greater certainty, but prudence would not permit me to venture near a coast subject to thick fogs on which there was no anchorage, where every port was blocked or filled up with ice, and the whole country, from the summits of the mountains down to the very brink of the cliffs which terminate the coast, covered many fathoms thick with everlasting snow. The cliffs alone was all which was to be seen, like land. Several large ice islands lay upon the coast, one of which attracted my notice. It had a flat surface, was of considerable extent both in height and circuit, and had perpendicular sides, on which the waves of the sea had made no impression, by which I judged that it had not been long from land, and that it might lately have come out of some bay on the coast where it had been formed. At noon we were east and west of the northern part of Cape Montague, distant about five leagues, and Friesland Peak were south 16 degrees east, distant 12 leagues, latitude observed 58 degrees 25 minutes south. In the morning the variation was 10 degrees 11 minutes east. At two in the afternoon, as we were standing to the north, with a light breeze at southwest, we saw land bearing north 25 degrees east, distant 14 leagues. Cape Montague bore at this time south 66 degrees east. At eight it bore south 40 degrees east, Cape Bristol south by east, the new land extending from north 40 degrees to 52 degrees east, and we thought we saw land still more to the east and beyond it. Continuing to steer to the north all night at six o'clock the next morning, a new land was seen bearing north 12 degrees east, about 10 leagues distant. It appeared in two hummocks just peeping above the horizon, but we soon after lost sight of them, and having got the wind at north north a fresh breeze, we stood for the northernmost land we had seen the day before, which at this time bore east south east. We fetched in with it by ten o'clock, but could not weather it, and were obliged to tack three miles from the coast, which extended from east by south to south east, and had much the appearance of being an island of about eight or ten league circuit. It shows a surface of considerable height, whose summit was lost in the clouds, and, like all the neighbouring lands, covered with a sheet of snow and ice, except in a projecting point on the north side, and two hills seen over this point, which probably might be two islands. These only were clear of snow and seemed covered with a green turf. Some large ice islands lay to the northeast and some others to the south. We stood off till noon and then tacked for the land again in order to see whether it was an island or no. The weather was now become very hazy, which soon turning to a thick fog put a stop to discovery and made it unsafe to stand for the shore, so that after having run the same distance in as we had run off, we tacked and stood to northwest for the land we had seen in the morning, which was yet at a considerable distance. Thus we were obliged to leave the other, under the supposition of its being an island, which I named Saunders, after my honourable friend Sir Charles. It is situated in the latitude of 57 degrees, 49 minutes south, longitude 26 degrees, 44 minutes west, and north, distant 13 leagues, from Cape Montague. At six o'clock in the evening, the wind shifting to the west, we tacked and stood to the north, 
and at eight the fog clearing away gave us a sight of saunders's isle extending from south-east by south to east-south-east we were still in doubt if it was an island for at this time land was seen bearing east by south which might or might not be connected with it it might also be the same that we had seen the preceding evening but be this as it may it was now necessary to take a view of the land to the north before we proceeded any farther to the east with this intention we stood to the north having a light breeze at west by south which at two o'clock in the morning of the third was succeeded by a calm that continued till eight when we got the wind at the east by south attended by hazy weather at this time we saw the land we were looking for and which proved to be two isles the day on which they were discovered was the occasion of calling them candlemas isles latitude fifty seven degrees eleven minutes south longitude twenty seven degrees six minutes west they were of no great extent but of considerable height and were covered with snow a small rock was seen between them and perhaps there may be more for the weather was so hazy that we soon lost sight of the islands and did not see them again till noon at which time they bore west distant three or four leagues as the wind kept veering to the south we were obliged to stand to the northeast in which route we met with several large ice islands loose ice and many penguins and at midnight came at once into water uncommonly white which alarmed the officer of the watch so much that he tacked the ship instantly some thought it was a float of ice others that it was shallow water but as it proved neither probably it was a shoal of fish we stood to the south till two o'clock next morning when we resumed our course to the east with a faint breeze at south south east which having ended in a calm at six i took the opportunity of putting a boat in the water to try if there were any current and the trial proved there was none some whales were playing about us and an abundance of penguins a few of the latter were shot and they proved to be of the same sort that we had seen among the ice before and different both from those on staten land and from those on the isle of georgia it is remarkable that we had not seen a seal since we left that coast at noon we were in latitude of fifty six degrees forty four minutes south longitude twenty five degrees thirty three minutes west at this time we got a breeze at east with which we stood to the south with a view of gaining the coast we had left but at eight o'clock the wind shifted to the south and made it necessary to tack and stand to the east in which course we met with several ice islands and some loose ice the weather continuing hazy with snow and rain no penguins were seen on the fifth which made me conjecture that we were leaving the land behind us and that we had already seen its northern extremity at noon we were in the latitude of fifty seven degrees eight minutes south longitude twenty three degrees thirty four minutes west which was three degrees of longitude to the east of saunders's isle in the afternoon the wind shifted to the west this enabled us to stretch to the south and to get into the latitude of the land that if it took an east direction we might again fall in with it we continued to steer to the south and southeast till next day at noon at which time we were in the latitude of fifty eight degrees fifteen minutes south longitude twenty one degrees thirty four minutes west and seeing neither land nor signs of any i concluded that what we had seen which i named sandwich land was either a group of islands or else a point of the continent 
for I firmly believe that there is a tract of land near the pole which is the source of most of the ice that is spread over this vast southern ocean. I also think it probable that it extends farthest to the north opposite the southern Atlantic and Indian oceans, because ice was always found by us farther to the north in these oceans than anywhere else, which I judge could not be if there were not land to the south. I mean a land of considerable extent, for if we suppose that no such land exists, and that ice may be formed without it, it will follow, of course, the cold ought to be everywhere nearly equal round the pole, as far as 70 degrees or 60 degrees of latitude, or so far as to be beyond the influence of any of the known continents. Consequently, we ought to see ice everywhere under the same parallel, or near it, and yet the contrary has been found. Very few ships have met with ice going round Cape Horn, and we saw but little below the 60th degree of latitude in the southern Pacific Ocean, whereas in this ocean, between the meridian of 40 degrees west and 50 or 60 degrees east, we found ice as far north as 51 degrees. Bouvet met with some in 48 degrees, and others have seen it in a much lower latitude. It is true, however, that the greatest part of this southern continent, supposing there is one, must lie within the polar circle, where the sea is so pestered with ice that the land is thereby inaccessible. The risk one runs in exploring a coast in these unknown and icy seas is so very great that I can be bold enough to say that no man will ever venture farther than I have done, and that the lands which may lie to the south will never be explored. Thick fogs, snowstorms, intense cold, and every other thing that can render navigation dangerous must be encountered, and these difficulties are greatly heightened by the inexpressibly horrid aspect of the country, a country doomed by nature never once to feel the warmth of the sun's rays, but to lie buried in everlasting snow and ice. The ports which may be on the coast are, in a manner, wholly filled up with frozen snow of vast thickness, but if any should be so far open as to invite a ship into it, she would run a risk of being fixed there for ever, or of coming out in an ice island. The islands and floats on the coast, the great falls from the ice cliffs in the port, or a heavy snowstorm attended with a sharp frost, would be equally fatal. After such an explanation as this, the reader must not expect to find me much farther to the south. It was, however, not for want of inclination, but for other reasons. It would have been rashness in me to have risked all that had been done during the voyage in discovering and exploring a coast which, when discovered and explored, would have answered no need whatever, or have been of the least use either to navigation or geography, or indeed to any other science. Bouvet's discovery was yet before us, the existence of which was to be cleared up, and besides all this, we were not now in a condition to undertake great things, nor indeed was there time, had we been ever so well provided. These reasons induced me to alter the course to the east, with a very strong gale at north, attended with an exceedingly heavy fall of snow. The quantity which lodged on our sails was so great, that we were frequently obliged to throw the ship up in the wind to shake it out of them, otherwise neither they nor the ship could have supported the weight. In the evening it ceased to snow, the weather cleared up, the wind back to the west, and we spent the night in making two short boards under close reef topsails and foresail. At daybreak on the 7th, we resumed our course to the east with a very fresh gale at southwest by west, 
attended by a high sea from the same direction. In the afternoon, being in the latitude of 58 degrees 24 minutes south, longitude 16 degrees 19 minutes west, the variation was 1 degree 52 minutes east. Only three ice islands seen this day. At 8 o'clock, shorten sail and hauled the wind to the southeast for the night, in which we had several showers of snow and sleet. On the 8th at daybreak, we resumed our east course with a gentle breeze and fair weather. After sunrise, being then in the latitude of 58 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 15 degrees 14 minutes west, the variation by the mean results of two compasses was 2 degrees 43 minutes east. These observations were more to be depended on than those made the night before, there being much less sea now than then. In the afternoon we passed three ice islands. This night was spent as the preceding. At six next morning, being in the latitude of 58 degrees 27 minutes south, longitude 13 degrees 4 minutes west, the variation was 26 minutes east, and in the afternoon, being in the same latitude and about a quarter of a degree more to the east, it was two minutes west. Therefore, this last situation must be in or near the line in which the compass has no variation. We had a calm the most part of the day. The weather fair and clear, excepting now and then a snow shower. The mercury in the thermometer at noon rose to 40 degrees, whereas for several days before it had been no higher than 36 or 38 degrees. We had several ice islands in sight, but no one thing that could induce us to think that any land was in our neighbourhood. At eight in the evening, a breeze sprung up at southeast, with which we stood to northeast. During the night, the wind freshened and veered south, which enabled us to steer east. The wind was attended with showers of sleet and snow till daylight, when the weather became fair, but piercing cold so that the water on deck was frozen, and at noon the mercury in the thermometer was no higher than 34.5 degrees. At 6 o'clock in the morning, the variation was 23 minutes west, being then in the latitude of 58 degrees 15 minutes south, longitude 11 degrees 41 minutes west, and at 6 in the evening, being in the same latitude, and in the longitude of 9 degrees 24 minutes west, it was 1 degree 51 minutes west. In the evening the wind abated, and during the night it was variable between south and west, ice islands continually in sight. On the 11th, wind westerly, light airs attended with heavy showers of snow in the morning, but as the day advanced, the weather became fair, clear and serene. Still continuing to steer east, at noon we observed in latitude 58 degrees 11 minutes, longitude at the same time 7 degrees 55 minutes west, thermometer 34 and two thirds degrees. In the afternoon we had two hours calm, after which we had faint breezes between the northeast and southeast. At six o'clock in the morning of the 12th, being in the latitude of 58 degrees 23 minutes south, longitude 6 degrees 54 minutes west, the variation was 3 degrees 23 minutes west. We had variable light airs next to a calm all this day, and the weather was fair and clear till towards the evening, when it became cloudy with snow showers and the air very cold. Ice islands continually in sight, most of them small and breaking to pieces. In the afternoon of the 13th, the wind increased, the sky became clouded, and soon after we had a very heavy fall of snow, which continued till 8 or 9 o'clock in the evening, when the wind abating and veering to southeast, 
the sky cleared up and we had a fair night, attended with so sharp a frost that the water in all our vessels on deck was next morning covered with a sheet of ice. The mercury in the thermometer was as low as 29 degrees, which is 3 degrees below freezing, or rather 4, for we generally found the water freeze when the mercury stood at 33 degrees. Towards noon on the 14th, the wind veering to the south increased to a very strong gale and blew in heavy squalls attended with snow. At intervals between the squalls, the weather was fair and clear, but exceedingly cold. We continued to steer east, inclining a little to the north, and in the afternoon crossed the first meridian, or that of Greenwich, in the latitude of 57 degrees 50 minutes south. At eight in the evening we close reefed the topsails, took in the mainsail, and steered east with a very hard gale at south-southwest and a high sea from the same direction. At daybreak on the 15th we set the mainsail, loosed a reef out of each topsail, and with a very strong gale at south-west and fair weather, steered east-north-east till noon, at which time we were in latitude 50 degrees 37 minutes south, longitude 4 degrees 11 minutes east, when we pointed to the northeast in order to get into the latitude of Cape Circumcision. Some large ice islands were in sight, and the air was nearly as cold as on the preceding day. At 8 o'clock in the evening, shortened sail, and at eleven hauled the wind to the northwest, not daring to stand on in the night, which was foggy with snow showers and a smart frost. At daybreak on the 16th we bore away northeast, with a light breeze at west, which at noon was succeeded by a calm and fair weather. Our latitude at this time was 55 degrees 26 minutes south, longitude 5 degrees 52 minutes east, in which situation we had a great swell from the southward, but no ice in sight. At one o'clock in the p.m., a breeze springing up at east-northeast, we stood to southeast till six, then tacked, and stood to the north under double-reefed topsails and courses, having a very fresh gale attended with snow and sleet, which fixed to the masts and rigging as it fell, and coated the whole with ice. On the 17th the wind continued veering by little and little to the south till midnight, when it fixed at southwest. Being at this time in the latitude of 54 degrees 20 minutes south, longitude 6 degrees 33 minutes east, I steered east, having a prodigious high sea from the south, which assured us no land was near in that direction. In the morning of the 18th it ceased to snow. The weather became fair and clear, and we found the variation to be 18 degrees 44 minutes west. At noon we were in the latitude of 54 degrees 25 minutes, longitude 8 degrees 46 minutes east. I thought this a good latitude to keep in, to look for Cape Circumcision, because if the land had ever so little extent in the direction of north and south, we could not miss seeing it, as the northern point is said to lie in 54 degrees. We had yet a great swell from the south, so that I was now well assured it could only be an island, and it was of no consequence which side we fell in with. In the evening Mr. Wales made several observations of the moon, and stars Regulus and Spica. The mean results at four o'clock, when the observations were made, for finding the time by the watch, gave 9 degrees 15 minutes 20 seconds east longitude. The watch at the same time gave 9 degrees 36 minutes 45 seconds, soon after the variation was found to be 13 degrees 10 minutes west. 
It is nearly in this situation that Mr. Bouvet had one degree east. I cannot suppose that the variation has altered so much since that time, but rather think he had made some mistake in his observations. That there could be none in ours was certain from the uniformity for some time past. Besides, we found 12 degrees 8 minutes west variation nearly under this meridian in January 1773. During the night, the wind veered round by the northwest to north northeast and blew a fresh gale. At eight in the morning of the 19th, we saw the appearance of land in the direction of east by south or that of our course, but it proved a mere fog bank and soon after dispersed. We continued to steer east by south and southeast till seven o'clock in the evening, when, being in the latitude of 54 degrees 42 minutes south, longitude 13 degrees 3 minutes east, and the wind having veered to northeast, we tacked and stood to northwest under close reef topsails and courses, having a very strong gale attended with snow showers. At four o'clock next morning, being in the latitude of 54 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 12 degrees 33 minutes east, we tacked and stretched to northeast with a fresh gale at southwest, attended with snow showers and sleet. At noon, being in the latitude of 54 degrees 8 minutes south, longitude 12 degrees 59 minutes east, with a fresh gale at west by north, and tolerably clear weather, we steered east till 10 o'clock in the evening, when we brought two, lest we might pass any land in the night, of which we, however, had not the least signs. At daybreak, having made sail, we bore away east, and at noon observed in latitude 54 degrees 16 minutes south, longitude 16 degrees 13 minutes east, which is 5 degrees to the east of the longitude in which Cape Circumcision is said to lie, so that we began to think there was no such land in existence. I, however, continued to steer east, inclining a little to the south, till four o'clock in the afternoon of the next day, when we were in latitude 54 degrees 24 minutes south, longitude 19 degrees 18 minutes east. We had now run down 13 degrees of longitude in the very latitude assigned for Bouvet's land. I was therefore well assured that what he had seen could be nothing but an island of ice, for if it had been land, it is hardly possible we could have missed it, though it were ever so small. Besides, from the time of leaving the southern lands, we had not met with the least signs of any other, but even suppose we had, it would have been no proof of the existence of Cape Circumcision, for I am well assured that neither seals nor penguins, nor any of the oceanic birds, are indubitable signs of the vicinity of land. I will allow that they are found on the coasts of all these southern lands, but are they not also to be found in all parts of the southern ocean? There are, however, some oceanic or aquatic birds which point out the vicinity of land, especially shags, which seldom go out of sight of it, and gannets, boobies, and men of war birds, I believe, seldom go very far out to sea. As we were now no more than two degrees of longitude from our route to the south, when we left the Cape of Good Hope, it was to no purpose to proceed any farther to the east under this parallel, knowing that no land could be there. But an opportunity now offering of clearing up some doubts of our having seen land farther to the south, I steered southeast to get into the situation in which it was supposed to lie. We continued this course till four o'clock the next morning, 
and then southeast by east and east south east till eight in the evening at which time we were in the latitude of fifty five degrees twenty five minutes south longitude twenty three degrees twenty two minutes east both deduced from observations made the same day for in the morning the sky was clear at intervals and afforded an opportunity to observe several distances of the sun and moon which we had not been able to do for some time past having had a constant succession of bad weather having now run over the place where the land was supposed to lie without seeing the least signs of any it was no longer to be doubted but that the ice islands had deceived us as well as mr bovet the wind by this time having veered to the north and increased to a perfect storm attended as usual with snow and sleet we handed the topsails and hauled up east north east under the courses during the night the wind abated and veered to northwest which enabled us to steer more to the north having no business farther south end of section 20section twenty one of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two by james cook book four chapter seven heads of what has been done in the voyage with some conjectures concerning the formation of ice islands and an account of our proceedings till our arrival at the cape of good hope seventeen seventy five february i had now made the circuit of the southern ocean in a high latitude and traversed it in such a manner as to leave not the least room for the possibility of there being a continent unless near the pole and out of the reach of navigation by twice visiting the tropical sea i had not only settled the situation of some old discoveries but made there many new ones and left i conceive very little more to be done even in that part thus i flatter myself that the intention of the voyage has in every respect been fully answered the southern hemisphere sufficiently explored and a final end put to the searching after a southern continent which has at times engrossed the attention of some of the maritime powers for near two centuries past and been a favourite theory amongst the geographers of all ages that there may be a continent or large tract of land near the pole i will not deny on the contrary i am of opinion there is and it is probable that we have seen a part of it the excessive cold the many islands and vast floats of ice all tend to prove that there must be land to the south and for my persuasion that this southern land must lie or extend farthest to the north opposite to the southern atlantic and indian oceans i have already assigned some reasons to which i may add the greater degree of cold experienced by us in these seas than in the southern pacific ocean under the same parallels of latitude in this last ocean the mercury in the thermometer seldom fell so low as the freezing point till we were in sixty degrees and upwards whereas in the others it fell as low in the latitude of fifty four degrees this was certainly owing to there being a greater quantity of ice and to its extending farther to the north in these two seas than in the south pacific 
and if ice be first formed at or near land of which i have no doubt it will follow that the land also extends farther north the formation or coagulation of ice islands has not to my knowledge been thoroughly investigated some have supposed them to be formed by the freezing of the water at the mouths of large rivers or great cataracts where they accumulate till they are broken off by their own weight my observations will not allow me to acquiesce in this opinion because we never found any of the ice which we took up incorporated with earth or any of its produce as i think it must have been had it been coagulated in land waters it is a doubt with me whether there be any rivers in these countries it is certain that we saw not a river or stream of water on all the coast of georgia nor on any of the southern lands nor did we ever see a stream of water run from any of the ice islands how are we then to suppose that there are large rivers the valleys are covered many fathoms deep with everlasting snow and at the sea they terminate in icy cliffs of vast height it is here where the ice islands are formed not from streams of water but from consolidated snow and sleet which is almost continually falling or drifting down from the mountains especially in the winter when the frost must be intense during that season the ice cliffs must so accumulate as to fill up all the bays be they ever so large this is a fact which cannot be doubted as we have seen it so in summer these cliffs accumulate by continual falls of snow and what drifts from the mountains till they are no longer able to support their own weight and then large pieces break off which we call ice islands such as have a flat even surface must be of the ice formed in the bays and before the flat valleys the others which have a tapering unequal surface must be formed on or under the side of a coast composed of pointed rocks and precipices or some such uneven surface for we cannot suppose that snow alone as it falls can form on a plain surface such as the sea such a variety of high peaks and hills as we saw on many of the ice isles it is certainly more reasonable to believe that they are formed on a coast whose surface is somewhat similar to theirs i have observed that all the ice islands of any extent and before they begin to break to pieces are terminated by perpendicular cliffs of clear ice or frozen snow always on one or more sides but most generally all round many and those of the largest size which had a hilly and spiral surface showed a perpendicular cliff or side from the summit of the highest peak down to its base this to me was a convincing proof that these as well as the flat isles must have broken off from substances like themselves that is from some large tract of ice when i consider the vast quantity of ice we saw and the vicinity of the places to the pole where it is formed and where the degrees of longitude are very small i am led to believe that these ice cliffs extend a good way into the sea in some parts especially in such as are sheltered from the violence of the winds it may even be doubted if ever the wind is violent in the very high latitudes and that the sea will freeze over or the snow that falls upon it which amounts to the same thing we have instances in the northern hemisphere the baltic the gulf of st lawrence 
the Straits of Belle Isle, and many other equally large seas, are frequently frozen over in winter. Nor is this at all extraordinary, for we have found the degrees of cold at the surface of the sea, even in summer, to be two degrees below the freezing point. Consequently, nothing kept it from freezing but the salt it contains and the agitation of its surface. Whenever this last ceaseth in winter, when the frost is set in and there comes a fall of snow, it will freeze on the surface as it falls, and in a few days, or perhaps in one night, form such a sheet of ice as will not be easily broken up. Thus a foundation will be laid for it to accumulate to any thickness by falls of snow, without its being at all necessary for the sea water to freeze. It may be by this means these vast floats of low ice we find in the spring of the year are formed, and which, after they break up, are carried by the currents to the north. For, from all the observations I have been able to make, the currents everywhere in the high latitudes set to the north or to the northeast or northwest, but we have very seldom found them considerable. If this imperfect account of the formation of these extraordinary floating islands of ice, which is written wholly from my own observations, does not convey some useful hints to an abler pen, it will, however, convey some idea of the lands where they are formed lands doomed by nature to perpetual frigidness never to feel the warmth of the sun's rays whose horrible and savage aspect i have not words to describe such are the lands we have discovered what then may we expect those to be which lie still farther to the south for we may reasonably suppose that we have seen the best as lying most to the north if any one should have resolution and perseverance to clear up this point by proceeding farther than I have done, I shall not envy him the honour of the discovery, but I will be bold to say that the world will not be benefited by it. I had at this time some thoughts of revisiting the place where the French discovery is said to lie, but then I considered that, if they had really made this discovery, the end would be as fully answered as if I had done it myself. We know it can only be an island, and if we may judge from the degree of cold we found in that latitude, it cannot be a fertile one. Besides, this would have kept me two months longer at sea, and in a tempestuous latitude, which we were not in a condition to struggle with. Our sails and rigging were so much worn that something was giving way every hour, and we had nothing left either to repair or to replace them. Our provisions were in a state of decay, and consequently afforded little nourishment, and we had been a long time without refreshments. My people indeed were yet healthy, and would have cheerfully gone wherever I had thought proper to lead them, but I dreaded the scurvy laying hold of them at a time when we had nothing left to remove it. I must say, Father, that it would have been cruel in me to have continued the fatigues and hardships they were continually exposed to longer than was absolutely necessary. Their behaviour throughout the whole voyage merited every indulgence which it was in my power to give them, animated by the conduct of the officers they showed themselves capable of surmounting every difficulty and danger which came in their way and never once looked either upon the one or the other as being at all heightened by a separation from our consort the adventure all these considerations induce me to lay aside looking for the french discoveries and to steer for the cape of good hope with a resolution, however, of looking for the isles of Denia and Marcevin, which are laid down in Dr. Haley's variation chart 
in the latitude of 41 and a half degrees south and about four degrees of longitude to the east of the meridian of the cape of good hope with this view i steered northeast with a hard gale at northwest and thick weather and on the twenty fifth at noon we saw the last ice island being at that time in the latitude of fifty two degrees fifty two minutes south longitude twenty six degrees thirty one minutes east seventeen seventy five march the wind abating and veering to the south on the first of march we steered west in order to get farther from mr bouvet's track which was but a few degrees to the east of us being at this time in the latitude of forty six degrees forty four minutes south longitude thirty three degrees twenty minutes east in which situation we found the variation to be twenty three degrees thirty six minutes west it is somewhat remarkable that all the time we had northerly winds which were regular and constant for several days the weather was always thick and cloudy but as soon as they came south of west it cleared up and was fine and pleasant the barometer began to rise several days before this change happened but whether on account of it or our coming northward cannot be determined the wind remained not long at south before it veered round by the northeast to the northwest blowing fresh and by squalls attended as before with rain and thick misty weather we had some intervals of clear weather in the afternoon of the third when we found the variation to be twenty two degrees twenty six minutes west latitude at this time forty five degrees eight minutes south longitude thirty degrees fifty minutes east the following night was very stormy the wind blew from southwest and in excessively heavy squalls at short intervals between the squalls the wind would fall almost to a calm and then come on again with such fury that neither our sails nor rigging could withstand it several of the sails being split and a middle staysail being wholly lost the next morning the gale abated and we repaired the damage we had sustained in the best manner we could on the eighth being in the latitude of forty one degrees thirty minutes south longitude twenty six degrees fifty one minutes east the mercury in the thermometer rose to sixty one degrees and we found it necessary to put on lighter clothes as the wind continued invariably fixed between northwest and west we took every advantage to get to the west by tacking whenever it shifted anything in our favour but as we had a great swell against us our tacks were rather disadvantageous we daily saw albatrosses petrels and other oceanic birds but not the least sign of land on the eleventh in the latitude of forty degrees forty minutes south longitude twenty three degrees forty seven minutes east the variation was twenty degrees forty eight minutes west about noon the same day the wind shifted suddenly from northwest to southwest caused the mercury in the thermometer to fall as suddenly from sixty two degrees to fifty two degrees such was the different state of the air between a northerly and southerly wind the next day having several hours calm we put a boat in the water and shot some albatrosses and petrels which at this time were highly acceptable we were now nearly in the situation where the isles which we were in search of are said to lie however we saw nothing that could give us the least hope of finding them the calm continued till five o'clock of the next morning when it was succeeded by a breeze at west by south with which we stood to north northwest and at noon observed in latitude thirty eight degrees fifty one minutes south this was upwards of thirty miles more to the north than our log gave us and the watch showed that we had been set to the east also 
If these differences did not arise from some strong current, I know not how to account for them. Very strong currents have been found on the African coast, between Madagascar and the Cape of Good Hope, but I never heard of their extending so far from the land, nor is it probable they do. I rather suppose that this current has no connection with that on the coast, and that we happen to fall into some stream which is neither lasting nor regular. But these are points which require much time to investigate, and must therefore be left to the industry of future navigators. We were now two degrees to the north of the parallel in which the isles of Dernia and Marsavine are said to lie. We had seen nothing to encourage us to persevere in looking after them, and it must have taken up some time longer to find them or to prove their non-existence. Every one was impatient to get into port and for good reasons. As for a long time, we had had nothing but stale and salt provisions for which every one on board had lost all relish. These reasons induced me to yield to the general wish and to steer for the Cape of Good Hope, being at this time in the latitude of 38 degrees 38 minutes south, longitude 23 degrees 37 minutes east. The next day, the observed latitude at noon was only 17 miles to the north of that given by the log, so that we had either got out of the strength of the current, or it had ceased. On the 15th, the observed latitude at noon, together with the watch, showed that we had had a strong current setting to the southwest, the contrary direction to what we had experienced on some of the preceding days, as hath been mentioned. At daylight on the 16th, we saw two sail in the northwest quarter standing to the westward, and one of them showing Dutch colours. At ten o'clock we tacked and stood to the west also, being at this time in the latitude of 39 degrees 9 minutes south, longitude 22 degrees 38 minutes east. I now, in pursuance of my instructions, demanded of the officers and petty officers the log books and journals they had kept, which were delivered to me accordingly and sealed up for the inspection of the Admiralty. I also enjoined them and the whole crew not to divulge where we had been till they had their lordship's permission so to do. In the afternoon, the wind veered to the west and increased to a hard gale, which was of short duration, for the next day it fell and at noon veered to southeast. At this time, we were in the latitude of 34 degrees 49 minutes south longitude 22 degrees east, and on sounding found 56 fathoms water. In the evening we saw the land in the direction of east-northeast, about six leagues distant, and during the forepart of the night there was a great fire or light upon it. At daybreak on the 18th we saw the land again, bearing north-northwest six or seven leagues distant and the depth of water forty-eight fathoms. At nine o'clock, having little or no wind, we hoisted out a boat and sent on board one of the two ships before mentioned, which were about two leagues from us, but we were too impatient after news to regard the distance. Soon after, a breeze sprung up at west, with which we stood to the south, and presently three sail more appeared in sight to windward, one of which showed English colours. At 1 p.m. the boat returned from on board the Bounkernka Polder, Captain Cornelius Bosch, a Dutch Indiaman from Bengal. Captain Bosch, very obligingly, offered us sugar, arrack, and whatever he had to spare. Our people were told by some English seamen on board this ship that the adventure had arrived at the Cape of Good Hope twelve months ago, and that the crew of one of her boats had been murdered and eaten by the people of New Zealand, so that the story which we heard in Queen Charlotte's Sound 
was now no longer a mystery. We had light airs next to a calm till ten o'clock the next morning, when a breeze sprung up at west, and the English ship, which was to windward, bore down to us. She proved to be the true Briton, Captain Broadley, from China. As he did not intend to touch at the Cape, I put a letter on board him for the Secretary of the Admiralty. The account which we had heard of the adventure was now confirmed to us by the ship. We also got from on board her a parcel of old newspapers which were new to us and gave us some amusement, but these were the least favours we received from Captain Broadley. With a generosity peculiar to the commanders of the India Company's ships, he sent us fresh provisions, tea and other articles, which were very acceptable and deserve from me this public acknowledgement. In the afternoon we parted company. The true Briton stood out to sea and we in for the land, having a very fresh gale at west, which split our fore topsail in such a manner that we were obliged to bring another to the yard. At six o'clock we tacked within four or five miles of the shore, and as we judged about five or six leagues to the east of Cape Aguilas, we stood off till midnight when, the wind having veered round to the south, we tacked and stood along shore to the west. The wind kept veering more and more in our favour, and at last fixed at east-south-east, and blew for some hours a perfect hurricane. As soon as the storm began to subside, we made sail and hauled in for the land. Next day at noon, the table mountain over the Cape Town bore northeast by east, distant nine or ten leagues. By making use of this bearing and distance to reduce the longitude shown by the watch to the Cape Town, the error was found to be no more than 18 minutes in longitude, which it was too far to the east. Indeed, the difference found between it and the lunar observations since we left New Zealand had seldom exceeded half a degree and always the same way. The next morning, being with us Wednesday the 22nd, but with the people here Tuesday the 21st, we anchored in Table Bay, where we found several Dutch ships, some French, and the series Captain Nuta, an English East India Company ship from China, bound directly to England, by whom I sent a copy of the preceding part of this journal, some charts, and other drawings to the Admiralty. Before we had well got to an anchor, I dispatched an officer to acquaint the governor with our arrival and to request the necessary stores and refreshments, which were readily granted. As soon as the officer came back, we saluted the garrison with 13 guns, which compliment was immediately returned with an equal number. I now learnt that the adventure had called here on her return, and I found a letter from Captain Furneaux acquainting me with the loss of his boat and of ten of his best men in Queen Charlotte Sound. The captain afterwards, on my arrival in England, put into my hands a complete narrative of his proceedings from the time of our second and final separation, which I now lay before the public in the following section. End of section 21「Section 22 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2 by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 8. Captain Furneaux's narrative of his proceeding in the adventure from the time he was separated from the resolution to his arrival in England, including Lieutenant Burney's report 
concerning the boat's crew who were murdered by the inhabitants of Queen Charlotte's Sound. 1773 October After a passage of 14 days from Amsterdam, we made the coast of New Zealand near the Table Cape and stood along shore till we came as far as Cape Turnagain. The wind then began to blow strong at west, with heavy squalls and rain, which split many of our sails, and blew us off the coast for three days, in which time we parted company with the resolution, and never saw her afterwards. 1773 November On the 4th of November, we again got in shore, near Cape Palliser, and were visited by a number of the natives in their canoes, bringing a great quantity of crayfish, which we bought of them for nails and Otaheite cloth. The next day it blew hard from west-north-west, which again drove us off the coast, and obliged us to bring two for two days, during which time it blew one continual gale of wind, with heavy falls of sleet. By this time our decks were very leaky, our beds and bedding wet, and several of our people complaining of colds, so that we began to despair of ever getting into Charlotte Sound or joining the resolution. On the 6th, being to the north of the Cape, the wind at southwest and blowing strong, we bore away for some bay to complete our water and wood, being in great want of both, having been at the allowance of one quart of water for some days past, and even that pittance could not be come at above six or seven days longer. We anchored at Targa Bay on the 9th, in latitude 38 degrees 21 minutes south, longitude 178 degrees 31 minutes east. It affords good riding with the wind westerly, and regular soundings from 11 to 5 fathoms, stiff muddy ground across the bay for about two miles. It is open from north-north-east to east-south-east. It is to be observed easterly winds seldom blow hard on this shore, but when they do, they throw in a great sea, so that if it were not for a great undertow, together with a large river that empties itself in the bottom of the bay, a ship would not be able to ride here. Wood and water are easily to be had, except when it blows hard easterly. The natives here are the same as those at Charlotte Sound, but more numerous, and seem settled, having regular plantations of sweet potatoes and other roots, which are very good, and they have plenty of cray and other fish, which we bought of them for nails, beads, and other trifles, at an easy rate. In one of their canoes we observed the head of a woman lying in state, adorned with feathers and other ornaments. It had the appearance of being alive, but on examination we found it dry, being preserved with every feature perfect, and kept as the relic of some deceased relation. Having got about ten tons of water and some wood, we sailed for Charlotte Sound on the 12th. We were no sooner out than the wind began to blow hard, dead on the shore, so that we could not clear the land on either tack. This obliged us to bear away again for the bay, where we anchored the next morning, and rode out a very heavy gale of wind at east by south, which threw in a very great sea. We now began to fear we should never join the resolution, having reason to believe she was in Charlotte Sound, and by this time ready for sea. We soon found it was with great difficulty we could get any water, owing to the swell setting in so strong. At last, however, we were able to go on shore, and got both wood and water. Whilst we lay here, we were employed about the rigging, which was much damaged by the constant gales of wind, we had met with since we made the coast. We got the booms down on the decks, and having made the ship as snug as possible, 
sailed again on the 16th. After this we met with several gales of wind off the mouth of the strait, and continued beating backwards and forwards till the 30th, when we were so fortunate as to get a favourable wind, which we took every advantage of, and at last got safe into our desired port. We saw nothing of the resolution, and began to doubt her safety, but on going ashore, we discerned the place where she had erected her tents, and, on an old stump of a tree in the garden, observed these words cut out, look underneath. There we dug and soon found a bottle corked and waxed down, with a letter in it from Captain Cook, signifying their arrival on the third instant, and departure on the twenty-fourth, and that they intended spending a few days in the entrance of the straits to look for us. We immediately set about getting the ship ready for sea as fast as possible, erected our tents, sent the cooper on shore to repair the casks, and began to unstow the hold to get at the bread that was in butts, but on opening them found a great quantity of it entirely spoiled, and most part so damaged, that we were obliged to fix our copper oven on shore to bake it over again, which undoubtedly delayed us a considerable time. Whilst we lay here, the inhabitants came on board as before, supplying us with fish and other things of their own manufacture, which we bought of them for nails, etc., and appeared very friendly, though twice in the middle of the night they came to the tent with an intention to steal, but were discovered before they could get anything into their possession. 1773 December On the 17th of December, having refitted the ship, completed our water and wood, and got everything ready for sea, we sent our large cutter with Mr. Rowe, a midshipman, and the boat's crew to gather wild greens for the ship's company, with orders to return that evening, as I intended to sail the next morning. But on the boats not returning the same evening, nor the next morning, being under great uneasiness about her, I hoisted out the launch, and sent her with the second lieutenant, Mr. Burney, manned with a boat's crew and ten marines, in search of her. My orders to Mr. Burney were first to look well into East Bay, and then to proceed to Grass Cove, the place to which Mr. Rowe had been sent, and if he heard nothing of the boat there, to go farther up the sound and come back along the west shore. As Mr. Rowe had left the ship an hour before the time proposed, and in a great hurry, I was strongly persuaded that his curiosity had carried him into East Bay, none in our ship having ever been there, or else that some accident had happened to the boat, either by going adrift through the boat keeper's negligence, or by being stove among the rocks. This was almost everybody's opinion, and on this supposition, the carpenter's mate was sent in the launch with some sheets of tin. I had not the least suspicion that our people had received any injury from the natives, our boats having frequently been higher up and worse provided. How much I was mistaken too soon appeared, for Mr. Burney, having returned about eleven o'clock the same night, made his report of a horrible scene indeed, which cannot be better described than in his own words, which now follow. On the 18th we left the ship, and having a light breeze in our favour, we soon got round Long Island and within Long Point. I examined every cove on the larboard hand as we went along, looking well all round with a spyglass, which I took for that purpose. At half past one we stopped at a beach on the left-hand side going up East Bay, to boil some victuals, as we brought nothing but raw meat with us. Whilst we were cooking, I saw an Indian on the opposite shore, running along a beach to the head of the bay. Our meat being dressed, we got into the boat and put off, 
and in a short time arrived at the head of this reach where we saw an Indian settlement. As we drew near, some of the Indians came down on the rocks and waved for us to be gone, but seeing we disregarded them, they altered their notes. Here we found six large canoes hauled up on the beach, most of them double ones, and a great many people, though not so many as one might expect from the number of houses and size of the canoes. Leaving the boat's crew to guard the boat, I stepped ashore with the marines, the corporal and five men, and searched a good many of their houses, but found nothing to give me any suspicion. Three or four well-beaten paths led farther into the woods, where were many more houses, but the people continuing friendly, I thought it unnecessary to continue our search. Coming down to the beach, one of the Indians had brought a bundle of hepatitus, long spears, but seeing I looked very earnestly at him, he put them on the ground and walked about with seeming unconcern. Some of the people appeared to be frightened. I gave a looking glass to one and a large nail to the other. From this place the bay ran, as nearly as I could guess, north northwest a good mile, where it ended in a long sandy beach. I looked all around with the glass, but saw no boat, canoe, or sign of inhabitant. I therefore contented myself with firing some guns which I had done in every cove as I went along. I now kept close to the east shore and came to another settlement where the Indians invited us ashore. I inquired of them about the boat, but they pretended ignorance. They appeared very friendly here and sold us some fish. Within an hour after we left this place, in a small beach adjoining to Grass Cove, we saw a very large double canoe just hauled up with two men and a dog. The men on seeing us left their canoe and ran up into the woods. This gave me reason to suspect I should here get tidings of the cutter. We went ashore and searched the canoe where we found one of the rollock ports of the cutter and some shoes, one of which was known to belong to Mr. Woodhouse, one of our midshipmen. One of the people at the same time brought me a piece of meat, which he took to be some of the salt meat belonging to the cutter's crew. On examining this and smelling to it, I found it was fresh. Mr. Fannin, the master, who was with me, supposed it was dog's flesh, and I was of the same opinion, for I still doubted there being cannibals but we were soon convinced by most horrid and undeniable proof. A great many baskets, about twenty, lying on the beach, tied up, we cut them open. Some were full of roasted flesh and some of fern root, which serves them for bread. On farther search we found more shoes and a hand, which we immediately knew to have belonged to Thomas Hill, one of our forecastle men it being marked T.H. with an Otaheite tattoo instrument. I went with some of the people a little way up the woods, but saw nothing else. Coming down again, there was a round spot covered with fresh earth, about four feet diameter, where something had been buried. Having no spade, we began to dig with a cutlass, and in the meantime I launched the canoe, with intent to destroy her, but seeing a great smoke ascending over the nearest hill, I got all the people into the boat, and made what haste I could to be with them before sunset. On opening the next bay, which was Grass Cove, we saw four canoes, one single and three double ones, and a great many people on the beach, who, on our approach, retreated to a small hill, within a ship's length of the waterside, where they stood talking to us. A large fire was on the top of the high land, beyond the woods, from whence, all the way down the hill, the place was thronged like a fair. As we came in, 
I ordered a musketoon to be fired at one of the canoes, suspecting they might be full of men lying down in the bottom, for they were all afloat, but nobody was seen in them. The savages on the little hill still kept hallooing and making signs for us to land. However, as soon as we got close in, we all fired. The first volley did not seem to affect them much, but on the second they began to scramble away as fast as they could, some of them howling. We continued firing as long as we could see the glimpse of any of them through the bushes. Amongst the Indians were two very stout men, who never offered to move till they found themselves forsaken by their companions, and then they marched away with great composure and deliberation, their pride not suffering them to run. One of them, however, got a fall, and either lay there or crawled off on all fours. The other got clear without any apparent hurt. I then landed with the Marines, and Mr. Fannin stayed to guard the boat. On the beach were two bundles of celery, which had been gathered for loading the cutter. A broken oar was stuck upright in the ground, to which the natives had tied their canoes, a proof that the attack had been made here. I then searched all along the back of the beach to see if the cutter was there. We found no boat, but instead of her, such a shocking scene of carnage and barbarity as can never be mentioned or thought of but with horror for the heads hearts and lungs of several of our people were seen lying on the beach and at a little distance the dogs gnawing their entrails whilst we remained almost stupefied on the spot mr fannon called to us that he heard the savages gathering together in the woods on which i returned to the boat and hauling alongside the canoes, we demolished three of them. Whilst this was transacting, the fire on the top of the hill disappeared, and we could hear the Indians in the woods at high words, I suppose quarrelling whether or no they should attack us and try to save their canoes. It now grew dark. I therefore just stepped out and looked once more behind the beach, to see if the cutter had been hauled up in the bushes, but seeing nothing of her returned and put off. Our whole force would have been barely sufficient to have gone up the hill, and to have ventured with half, for half must have been left to guard the boat, would have been foolhardiness. As we opened the upper part of the sound, we saw a very large fire about three or four miles higher up, which formed a complete oval, reaching from the top of the hill down almost to the water side, the middle space being enclosed all round by the fire, like a hedge. I consulted with Mr. Fannin, and we were both of opinion that we could expect to reap no other advantage than the poor satisfaction of killing some more of the savages. On leaving Grass Cove, we had fired a general volley towards where we heard the Indians talking, but by going in and out of the boat, the arms had got wet, and four pieces missed fire. What was still worse, it began to rain. Our ammunition was more than half expended, and we left six large canoes behind us in one place. With so many disadvantages, I did not think it worth while to proceed, where nothing could be hoped for but revenge. Coming between two round islands situated to the southward of East Bay, we imagined we heard somebody calling. We lay on our oars and listened, but heard no more of it. We hallooed several times, but to little purpose. The poor souls were far enough out of hearing, and indeed, I think it's some comfort to reflect that in all probability, every man of them must have been killed on the spot. Thus far, Mr. Burney's report, and to complete the account of this tragical transaction, it may not be unnecessary to mention that the people in the cutter were Mr. Rowe, Mr. Woodhouse, 
Francis Murphy, Quartermaster, William Facey, Thomas Hill, Michael Bell and Edward Jones, four castlemen, John Cavanaugh and Thomas Milton, belonging to the after guard, and James Severley, the captain's man, being ten in all. Most of them were our very best seamen, the stoutest and most healthy people in the ship. Mr. Burney's party brought on board two hands, one belonging to Mr. Rowe, known by a hurt he had received on it, the other to Thomas Hill, as before mentioned, and the head of the captain's servant. These, with more of the remains, were tied in a hammock and thrown overboard with ballast and shot sufficient to sink it. None of their arms nor clothes were found, except part of a pair of trousers, a frock and six shoes, no two of them being fellows. I am not inclined to think this was any premeditated plan of these savages, for the morning Mr. Rowe left the ship, he met two canoes which came down and stayed all the forenoon in Ship Cove. It might probably happen from some quarrel which was decided on the spot, or the fairness of the opportunity might tempt them, our people being so incautious and thinking themselves too secure. Another thing which encouraged the New Zealanders was they were sensible that a gun was not infallible, that they sometimes missed, and that, when discharged, they must be loaded before they could be used again, which time they knew how to take advantage of. After their success, I imagine there was a general meeting on the east side of the Sound. The Indians of Shag Cove were there. This we knew by a cock which was in one of the canoes, and by a long single canoe, which some of our people had seen four days before in Shag Cove, where they had been with Mr. Rowe in the cutter. We were detained in the Sound by contrary winds, four days after this melancholy affair happened, during which time we saw none of the inhabitants. What is very remarkable, I had been several times up in the same cove with Captain Cook, and never saw the least sign of an inhabitant, except some deserted towns, which appeared as if they had not been occupied for several years. And yet, when Mr. Burney entered the cove, he was of opinion there could not be less than 1,500 or 2,000 people. I doubt not, had they been apprised of his coming, they would have attacked him. From these considerations, I thought it imprudent to send a boat up again, as we were convinced there was not the least probability of any of our people being alive. On the 23rd, we weighed and made sail out of the Sound, and stood to the eastward to get clear of the straits, which we accomplished the same evening, but were baffled for two or three days with light winds before we could clear the coast. We then stood to the south-south-east till we got into the latitude of 56 degrees south, without anything remarkable happening, having a great swell from the southward. At this time the wind began to blow strong from the south-west, and the weather to be very cold, and as the ship was low and deep laden, the sea made a continual breach over her, which kept us always wet, and by her straining, very few of the people were dry in bed or on deck, having no shelter to keep the sea from them. The birds were the only companions we had in this vast ocean, except now and then, we saw a whale or porpoise, and sometimes a seal or two, and a few penguins. In the latitude of 58 degrees south, longitude 213 degrees east. Footnote, about 147 west longitude, I reckon. End footnote, we fell in with some ice, and every day saw more or less, we then standing to the east we found a very strong current setting to the eastward, for by the time we were abreast of Cape Horn, being in the latitude of 61 degrees south, 
The ship was ahead of our account eight degrees. We were very little more than a month from Cape Palliser in New Zealand to Cape Horn, which is an hundred and twenty-one degrees of longitude and had continual westerly winds from southwest to northwest with the great sea following. 1774 January On opening some casks of peace and flour that had been stowed on the coals, we found them very much damaged and not eatable, so thought it most prudent to make for the Cape of Good Hope, but first to sand into the latitude and longitude of Cape Circumcision. After being to the eastward of Cape Horn, we found the winds did not blow so strong from the westward as usual, but came more from the north, which brought on thick, foggy weather, so that, for several days together, we could not be able to get an observation or see the least sign of the sun. This weather lasted above a month, being then among a great many islands of ice, which kept us constantly on the lookout for fear of running foul of them, and being a single ship, made us more attentive. By this time our people began to complain of colds and pains in their limbs, which obliged me to haul to the northward to the latitude of 54 degrees south, but as we still continued to have the same sort of weather, though we had oftener an opportunity of obtaining observations for the latitude. 1774 February After getting into the latitude above mentioned, I steered to the east in order, if possible, to find the land laid down by Bovet. As we advanced to the east, the islands of ice became more numerous and dangerous they being much smaller than they used to be, and the nights began to be dark. 1774 March On the 3rd of March, being then in the latitude of 54 degrees 4 minutes south, longitude 13 degrees east, which is the latitude of Bouvet's discovery, and half a degree to the eastward of it, and not seeing the least sign of land, either now or since we have been in this parallel, I gave over looking for it and hauled away to the northward. As our last track to the southward was within a few degrees of Bouvet's discovery in the longitude assigned to it, and about three or four degrees to the southward, should there be any land thereabout, it must be a very inconsiderable island. But I believe it was nothing but ice, as we, in our first setting out, Thought we had seen land several times, but it proved to be high islands of ice at the back of the large fields. And as it was thick foggy weather when Mr. Bouvet fell in with it, he might very easily mistake them for land. On the 7th, being in the latitude of 48 degrees 30 minutes south, longitude 14 degrees 26 minutes east, saw two large islands of ice. On the 17th made the land of the Cape of Good Hope, and on the 19th anchored in Table Bay, where we found Commodore Sir Edmund Hughes with His Majesty's ships Salisbury and Seahorse. I saluted the Commodore with 13 guns, and soon after the garrison with the same number. The former returned the salute as usual, with two guns less, and the latter with an equal number. 1774, March to July. On the 24th, Sir Edward Hughes sailed with the Salisbury and Seahorse for the East Indies, but I remained refitting the ship and refreshing the people till the 16th of April, when I sailed for England, and on the 14th of July anchored at Spithead. End of section 22. Section 23 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 9. Transactions at the Cape of Good Hope, with an account of some discoveries made by the French, and the arrival of the ship at St. Helena. 1775, March 22nd. I now resume my own journal, which Captain Furneaux's interesting narrative in the preceding section had obliged me to suspend. The day after my arrival at the Cape of Good Hope, I went on shore and waited on the governor, Baron Plettenberg, and other principal officers, who received and treated us with the greatest politeness, contributing all in their power to make it agreeable, and as there are few people more obliging to strangers than the Dutch in general at this place, and refreshments of all kinds are nowhere to be got in such abundance, we enjoyed some real repose after the fatigues of a long voyage. The good treatment which strangers meet with at the Cape of Good Hope and the necessity of breathing a little fresh air has introduced a custom not common anywhere else, at least I have nowhere seen it so strictly observed, which is for all the officers who can be spared out of the ship to reside on shore. We followed this custom. Myself, the two Mr. Forsters, and Mr. Sparman took up our abode with Mr. Brandt, a gentleman well known to the English by his obliging readiness to serve them. My first care after my arrival was to procure fresh baked bread, fresh meat, greens and wine for those who remained on board, and being provided every day during our stay with these articles, they were soon restored to their usual strength. We had only three men on board, whom it was thought necessary to send on shore for the recovery of their health, and for these I procured quarters at the rate of thirty stivers, or half a crown per day, for which they were provided with victuals, drink, and lodging. We now went to work to supply all our defects. For this purpose, by permission, we erected a tent on shore, to which we sent our casks and sails to be repaired. We also struck the yards and topmasts in order to overhaul the rigging, which we found in so bad a condition that almost everything, except the standing rigging, was obliged to be replaced with new, and that was purchased at a most exorbitant price. In the article of naval stores, the Dutch here, as well as at Batavia, take a shameful advantage of the distress of foreigners. That our rigging, sails, etc. should be worn out will not be wondered at, when it is known that during this circumnavigation of the globe, that is, from our leaving this place to our return to it again, we had sailed no less than 20,000 leagues, an extent of voyage nearly equal to three times the equatorial circumference of the earth, and which I apprehend was never sailed by any ship in the same space of time before. And yet in all this grand run, which had been made in all latitudes between 9 degrees and 71 degrees, we sprung neither low mast, top mast, lower nor topsail yard, nor so much as broke a lower or top mast shroud, which, with the great care and abilities of my officers, must be owing to the good properties of the ship. One of the French ships which were at anchor in the bay was the Ajax Indiaman, bound to Pontichery, commanded by Captain Crozet. He had been second in command with Captain Marion, who sailed from this place with two ships in March 1772, as hath been already mentioned. Instead of going from hence to America, as was said, he stood away for New Zealand where, in the Bay of Isles, he and some of his people were killed by the inhabitants. 
Captain Crozet, who succeeded to the command, returned by the way of the Philippine Isles with the two ships to the island of Mauritius. He seemed to be a man possessed of the true spirit of discovery and to have abilities. In a very obliging manner, he communicated to me a chart wherein were delineated not only his own discoveries, but also that of Captain Kerguelen, which I found laid down in the very situation where we search for it, so that I can by no means conceive how both we and the adventure missed it. Besides this land which Captain Crozet told us was a long but very narrow island extending east and west, Captain Marion, in about the latitude of 48 degrees south, and from 16 degrees to 30 degrees of longitude east of the Cape of Good Hope, discovered six islands which were high and barren. These, together with some islands lying between the line and the southern tropic in the Pacific Ocean, were the principal discoveries made in this voyage, the account of which, we were told, was ready for publication. By Captain Crozet's chart, it appeared that a voyage had been made by the French across the South Pacific Ocean in 1769, under the command of one Captain Serville, who, on condition of his attempting discoveries, had obtained leave to make a trading voyage to the coast of Peru. He fitted out and took in a cargo in some part of the East Indies, proceeded by way of the Philippine Isles, passed near New Britain, and discovered some land in the latitude of 10 degrees south, longitude 158 degrees east, to which he gave his own name. From hence he steered to the south, passed but a few degrees to the west of New Caledonia, fell in with New Zealand at its northern extremity, and put into Doubtful Bay, where it seems he was, when I passed it, on my former voyage in the Endeavour, from New Zealand, Captain Serville steered to the east, between the latitude of 35 degrees and 41 degrees south, until he arrived on the coast of America, where, in the port of Calau, in attempting to land, he was drowned. These voyages of the French, though undertaken by private adventurers, have contributed something towards exploring the Southern Ocean. That of Captain Serville clears up a mistake which I was led into in imagining the shoals off the west end of New Caledonia to extend to the west as far as New Holland. It proves that there is an open sea in that space and that we saw the northwest extremity of that country. From the same gentleman we learnt that the ship which had been at Otaheite before our first arrival there this voyage was from New Spain, and that in her return she had discovered some islands in the latitude of 32 degrees south and under the meridian of 130 degrees west. Some other islands, said to be discovered by the Spaniards, appeared on this chart but Captain Crozet seemed to think they were inserted from no good authorities. We were likewise informed of a later voyage undertaken by the French, under the command of Captain Kerguelen, which had ended much to the disgrace of that commander. While we lay in Table Bay, several foreign ships put in and out, bound to and from India, viz. English, French, Danes, Swedes, and three Spanish frigates, two of them going to and one coming from Manila. It is but very lately that the Spanish ships have touched here, and these were the first that were allowed the same privileges as other European friendly nations. 1775, March, April. On examining our rudder, the pintles were found to be loose, and we were obliged to unhang it and take it on shore to repair. 
We were also delayed for want of caulkers to caulk the ship, which was absolutely necessary to be done before we put to sea. At length I obtained two workmen from one of the Dutch ships, and the Dutch and English East Indiamen coming in from Bengal, Captain Rice obliged me with two more, so that by the 26th of April this work was finished, and having got on board all necessary stores and a fresh supply of provisions and water, we took leave of the governor and other principal officers, and the next morning repaired on board. Soon after the wind coming fair, we weighed and put to sea, as did also the Spanish frigate Juno from Manila, a Danish Indiaman, and the Dutton. As soon as we were under sail, we saluted the garrison with thirteen guns, which complement was immediately returned with the same number. The Spanish frigate and Danish Indiaman both saluted us as we passed them, and I returned each salute with an equal number of guns. When we were clear of the bay, the Danish ship steered for the East Indies, the Spanish frigate for Europe, and we and the Dutton for St. Helena. Depending on the goodness of Mr. Kendall's watch, I resolved to try to make the island by a direct course. For the first six days, that is, till we got into the latitude of 27 degrees south, longitude 11.5 degrees west of the Cape, the winds were southerly and southeast. After this, we had variable light airs for two days. They were succeeded by a wind at southeast, which continued to the island, except a part of one day, when it was at northeast. In general, the wind blew faint all the passage, which made it longer than common. 1775 May At daybreak in the morning of the 15th of May, we saw the island of St. Helena at a distance of 14 leagues, and at midnight anchored in the road before the town on the northwest side of the island. At sunrise the next morning, the castle and also the Dutton saluted us, each with 13 guns. On my landing soon after, I was saluted by the castle with the same number, and each of the salutes was returned by the ship. Governor Sketow and the principal gentlemen of the island received and treated me during my stay with the greatest politeness by showing me every kind of civility in their power. Whoever views St. Helena in its present state and can but conceive what it must have been originally will not hastily charge the inhabitants with want of industry though perhaps they might apply it to more advantage, were more land appropriated to planting of corn, vegetables, roots, etc., instead of being laid out to pasture, which is the present mode. But this is not likely to happen, so long as the greatest part of it remains in the hands of the company and their servants. Without industrious planters, this island can never flourish and be in a condition to supply the shipping with the necessary refreshments. Within these three years, a new church has been built. Some other new buildings were in hand. A commodious landing place for boats has been made, and several other improvements, which add both strength and beauty to the place. During our stay here, we finished some necessary repairs of the ship, which we had not time to do at the Cape. We also filled our empty water casks, and the crew were served with fresh beef, purchased at five pence per pound. Their beef is exceedingly good, and is the only refreshment to be had worth mentioning. By a series of observations made at the Cape Town, and at Fort James in St. Helena, at the former by Messrs. Mason and Dixon, and at the latter by Mr. Maskelyne, the Astronomer Royal. The difference of longitude between these two places is 24 degrees 12 minutes 15 seconds, only two miles more than Mr. Kendall's watch made. 
the lunar observations made by Mr. Wales before we arrived at the island and after we left it, and reduced to it by the watch, gave 5 degrees 51 minutes for the longitude of James Fort, which is only five miles more west than it is placed by Mr. Maskelyne. In like manner, the longitude of the Cape Town was found within five minutes of the truth. I mention this to show how near the longitude of places may be found by the lunar method, even at sea, with the assistance of a good watch. End of section 23section twenty four of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two by james cook book four chapter ten passage from st helena to the western isles with a description of the island of ascension and fernando norona seventeen seventy five may on the twenty first in the evening i took leave of the governor and repaired on board upon my leaving the shore i was saluted with thirteen guns and upon my getting under sail with the dutton in company i was saluted with thirteen more both of which i returned after leaving st helena the dutton was ordered to steer northwest by west or northwest by compass in order to avoid falling in with ascension at which island it was said an illicit trade was carried on between the officers of the India Company ships and some vessels from North America who, of late years, had frequented the island on pretense of fishing whales or catching turtle, when their real design was to wait the coming of the India ships. In order to prevent their homeward-bound ships from falling in with these smugglers, and to put a stop to this illicit trade, the Dutton was ordered to steer the course above mentioned, till to the northward of Ascension. I kept company with this ship till the 24th, when, after putting a packet on board her for the Admiralty, we parted, she continuing her course to the northwest, and I steering for Ascension. In the morning of the 28th I made the island, and the same evening anchored in Cross Bay, on the northwest side, in ten fathoms water, the bottom a fine sand and half a mile from the shore. The Cross Hill, so called on account of a cross or flagstaff, erected upon it, bore by compass south 38 degrees east, and the two extreme points of the bay, extended from northeast to southwest. We remained here till the evening of the thirty first, and notwithstanding we had several parties out every night, we got but twenty four turtle, it being rather too late in the season. However, as they weighed between four or five hundred pounds each, we thought ourselves not ill off. We might have had a plentiful supply of fish in general, especially of that sort called old wives, of which I have nowhere seen such abundance. There were also cavalies, conger eels, and various other sorts, but the catching of any of these was not attended to, the object being turtle. There are abundance of goats and aquatic birds, such as men of war and tropic birds, boobies, etc., the island of Ascension is about ten miles in length in the direction of northwest and southeast, and about five or six in breadth. It shows a surface composed of barren hills and valleys, on the most of which not a shrub or plant is to be seen for several miles, and where we found nothing but stones and sand, or rather flags and ashes. 
an indubitable sign that the isle at some remote time had been destroyed by a volcano which has thrown up vast heaps of stones and even hills between these heaps of stones we found a smooth even surface composed of ashes and sand and very good travelling upon it but one may as easily walk over broken glass bottles as over the stones if the foot deceives you you are sure to be cut or lamed which happened to some of our people a high mountain at the southeast end of the isle seems to be left in its original state and to have escaped the general destruction its soil is a kind of white marl which yet retains its vegetative qualities and produceth a kind of purslane spurge and one or two grasses on these the goats subsist and it is at this part of the isle where they are to be found as also land crabs which are said to be very good i was told that about this part of the isle is some very good land on which might be raised many necessary articles and some have been at the trouble of sowing turnips and other useful vegetables i was also told there is a fine spring in a valley which disjoins two hills on the top of the mountain above mentioned beside great quantities of fresh water in holes in the rocks which the person who gave me this information believed was collected from rains but these supplies of water can only be of use to the traveller or to those who may be so unfortunate as to be shipwrecked on the island which seems to have been the fate of some not long ago as appeared by the remains of a wreck we found on the northeast side by what we could judge she seemed to have been a vessel of about one hundred and fifty tons burden while we lay in the road a sloop of about seventy tons burden came to an anchor by us she belonged to new york which place she left in february and having been to the coast of guinea with a cargo of goods was come here to take in turtle to carry to barbados this was the story which the master whose name was greaves was pleased to tell and which may in part be true but i believe the chief view of his coming here was the expectation of meeting with some of the india ships he had been in the island near a week and had got on board twenty turtle a sloop belonging to bermuda had sailed but a few days before with one hundred and five on board which was as many as she could take in but having turned several more on the different sandy beaches they had ripped open their bellies taken out their eggs and left their carcasses to putrefy an act as inhuman as injurious to those who came after them part of the account i have given of the interior parts of this island i received from captain greaves who seemed to be a sensible intelligent man and had been all over it he sailed in the morning of the same day we did turtle i am told are to be found at this isle from january to june the method of catching them is to have people upon the several sandy bays to watch their coming on shore to lay their eggs which is always in the night and then to turn them on their backs till there be an opportunity to take them off the next day it was recommended to us to send a good many men to each beach where they were to lie quiet till the turtle were ashore and then rise and turn them at once this method may be the best when the turtle are numerous but when there are but few three or four men are sufficient for the largest beach and if they keep patrolling it close to the wash of the surf during the night by this method they will see all that come ashore and cause less noise than if there were more of them it was by this method we caught the most we got and this is the method by which the americans take them 
nothing is more certain than that all the turtle which are found about this island come here for the sole purpose of laying their eggs for we met with none but females and of all those which we caught not one had any food worth mentioning in its stomach a sure sign in my opinion that they must have been a long time without any and this may be the reason why the flesh of them is not so good as some i have eat on the coast of new south wales which were caught on the spot where they fed the watch made eight degrees forty five minutes difference of longitude between st helena and ascension which added to five degrees forty nine minutes the longitude of james fort in st helena gives fourteen degrees thirty four minutes for the longitude of the road of ascension or fourteen degrees thirty minutes for the middle of the island the latitude of which is eight degrees south the lunar observations made by mr wales and reduced to the same point of the island by the watch gave fourteen degrees twenty eight minutes thirty seconds west longitude on the thirty first of may we left ascension and steered to the northward with a fine gale at south east by east i had a great desire to visit the island of st matthew to settle its situation but as i found the wind would not let me fetch it i steered for the island of fernando de norona on the coast of brazil in order to determine its longitude as i could not find that this had been done perhaps i should have performed a more acceptable service to navigation if i had gone in search of the island of st paul and those shoals which are said to lie near the equator and about the meridian of twenty degrees west as neither their situation nor existence are well known the truth is i was unwilling to prolong the voyage in searching for what i was not sure to find nor was i willing to give up every object which might tend to the improvement of navigation or geography for the sake of getting home a week or a fortnight sooner it is but seldom that opportunities of this kind offer and when they do they are too often neglected in our passage to fernando de norona we had steady fresh gales between the southeast and east southeast attended with fair and clear weather and as we had the advantage of the moon a day or night did not pass without making lunar observations for determining our longitude in this run the variation of the compass gradually decreased from eleven degrees west which it was at ascension to one degree west which we found off fernando de norona this was the mean result of two compasses one of which gave one degree thirty seven minutes and the other twenty three minutes west seventeen seventy five june on the ninth of june at noon we made the island of fernando de norona bearing southwest by west a half west distant six or seven leagues as we afterwards found by the log it appeared in detached and peaked hills the largest of which looked like a church tower or steeple as we drew near the southeast part of the isle we perceived several unconnected sunken rocks lying near a league from the shore on which the sea broke in a great surf after standing very near these rocks we hoisted our colours and then bore up round the north end of the isle or rather round a group of little islets for we could see that the land was divided by narrow channels there is a strong fort on the one next the main island where there are several others all of which seem to have every advantage that nature can give them and they are so disposed as wholly to command all the anchoring and landing places about the island we continue to steer round the northern point till the sandy beaches before which is the road for shipping began to appear and the forts and the peaked hills 
were open to the westward of the said point. At this time, on a gun being fired from one of the forts, the Portuguese colours were displayed, and the example was followed by all the other forts. As the purpose for which I made the island was now answered, I had no intention to anchor, and therefore, after firing a gun to leeward, we made sail and stood away to the northward with a fine fresh gale at east-south-east. The peaked hill or church tower bore south, 27 degrees west, distant about four or five miles, and from this point of view it leans or overhangs to the east. This hill is nearly in the middle of the island, which nowhere exceeds two leagues in extent, and shows a hilly unequal surface, mostly covered with wood and herbage. Oloa says, This island hath two harbours capable of receiving ships of the greatest burden. One is on the north side and the other is on the northwest. The former is in every respect the principal, both for shelter and capacity, and the goodness of its bottom, but both are exposed to the north and west, though these winds, particularly the north, are periodical and of no long continuance. He further says that you anchor in the North Harbour, which is no more than what I would call a road, to thirteen fathoms water, one third of a league from shore, bottom of fine sand, the peaked hill above mentioned bearing southwest two degrees southerly. Footnote. See Don Antonio de Loa's book, Volume 2, Chapter 3, page 95 to 102, where there is a very particular account of this island. End footnote. This road seems to be well sheltered from the south and east winds. One of my seamen had been on board a Dutch India ship, who put in at this isle in her way out in 1770. They were very sickly and in want of refreshments and water. The Portuguese supplied them with some buffaloes and fowls, and they watered behind one of the beaches in a little pool, which was hardly big enough to dip a bucket in. By reducing the observed latitude at noon to the peaked hill, its latitude will be 3 degrees 53 minutes south, and its longitude by the watch carried on from St. Helena is 32 degrees 34 minutes west, and by observation of the sun and moon, made before and after we made the isle, and reduced to it by the watch, 32 degrees 44 minutes 30 seconds west. This was the mean result of my observations. The results of those made by Mr. Wales, which were more numerous, gave 32 degrees 23 minutes. The mean of these two will be pretty near the watch, and probably nearest the truth. By knowing the longitude of this isle, we were able to determine that of the adjacent east coast of Brazil, which, according to the modern charts, lies about 60 or 70 leagues more to the west. We might very safely have trusted to these charts, especially the variation chart for 1744 and Mr. Dalrymple's of the Southern Atlantic Ocean. Footnote. Oloa says, that the chart places this island 60 leagues from the coast of Brazil, and that the Portuguese pilots, who often make the voyage, judge it to be 80 leagues, but by taking the mean between the two opinions, the distance may be fixed at 70 leagues. End footnote. On the 11th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we crossed the equator in the longitude of 32 degrees 14 minutes west. We had fresh gales at east-south-east blowing in squalls, attended by showers of rain that continued at certain intervals till noon the next day, after which we had 24 hours fair weather. At noon on the 13th, being in the latitude of 3 degrees 49 minutes north, longitude 31 degrees 47 minutes west, 
the wind became variable between the north, east, and south, and we had light airs and squalls by turns, attended by hard showers of rain, and for the most part dark, gloomy weather, which continued till the evening of the 15th, when, in the latitude of 5 degrees 47 minutes north, longitude 31 degrees west, we had three calm days, in which time we did not advance above 10 or 12 leagues to the north. We had fair weather and rain by turns, the sky for the most part being obscured, and sometimes by heavy dense clouds, which broke in excessive hard showers. At seven o'clock in the evening on the 18th, the calm was succeeded by a breeze at east, which the next day increasing and veering to and fixing at northeast, we stretched to northwest with our tacks on board. We made no doubt that we had now got the northeast trade wind, as it was attended with fair weather, except now and then some light showers of rain and as we advanced to the north, the wind increased and blew a fresh top-gallant gale. On the 21st, I ordered the still to be fitted to the largest copper, which held about 64 gallons. The fire was lighted at four o'clock in the morning, and at six the still began to run. It was continued till six o'clock in the evening, in which time we obtained 32 gallons of fresh water at the expense of one bushel and a half of coals, which was about three-fourths of a bushel, more than was necessary to have boiled the ship's company's victuals only, but the expense of fuel was no object with me. The victuals were dressed in the small copper, the other being applied wholly to the still, and every method was made use of to obtain from it the greatest quantity of fresh water possible, as this was my sole motive for setting it to work. The mercury in the thermometer at noon was 84 and a half, and higher it is seldom found at sea. Had it been lower, more water, under the same circumstances, would undoubtedly have been produced, for the colder the air is, the cooler you can keep the still, which will condense the steam the faster. Upon the whole, this is a useful invention, but I would advise no man to trust wholly to it, for although you may, provided you have plenty of fuel and good coppers, obtain as much water as will support life, you cannot, with all your efforts, obtain sufficient to support health, in hot climates especially, where it is the most wanting, for I am well convinced that nothing contributes more to the health of seamen than having plenty of water. The wind now remained invariably fixed at northeast and east northeast, and blew fresh with squalls, attended with showers of rain, and the sky for the most part cloudy. On the 25th, in the latitude of 16 degrees 12 minutes north, longitude 37 degrees 20 minutes west, seeing a ship to windward steering down upon us, we shortened sail in order to speak with her, but finding she was Dutch by her colours, we made sail again and left her to pursue her course, which we supposed was to some of the Dutch settlements in the West Indies. In the latitude of 20 degrees north, longitude 39 degrees 45 minutes west, the wind began to veer to east by north and east, but the weather remained the same, that is, we continued to have it clear and cloudy by turns, with light squalls and showers. Our track was between northwest by north and north northwest till noon on the 28th after which our course made good was north by west, being at this time in the latitude of 21 degrees 21 minutes north, longitude 40 degrees 6 minutes west. Afterwards the wind began to blow a little more steady and was attended with fair and clear weather. At two o'clock in the morning of the 30th, being in the latitude of 24 degrees 20 minutes north, longitude 40 degrees 47 minutes west, 
a ship steering to the westward passed us within hail. We judged her to be English as they answered us in that language, but we could not understand what they said, and they were presently out of sight. In the latitude of 29 degrees 30 minutes, longitude 41 degrees 30 minutes, the wind slackened and veered more to the southeast. We now began to see some of that sea plant, which is commonly called gulf weed, from a supposition that it comes from the Gulf of Florida. Indeed, for aught I know to the contrary, it may be a fact, but it seems not necessary, as it is certainly a plant which vegetates at sea. We continue to see it, but always in small pieces, till we reach the latitude 36 degrees, longitude 39 degrees west, beyond which situation no more appeared. 1775 July on the 5th of July, in the latitude of 22 degrees, 31 minutes, 30 seconds north, longitude 40 degrees, 29 minutes west, the wind veered to the east and blew very faint. The next day it was calm. The two following days we had variable light airs and calms by turns, and at length on the 9th, having fixed at south-southwest, it increased to a fresh gale, with which we steered first northeast and then east northeast, with a view of making some of the Azores or Western Isles. On the 11th, in the latitude of 36 degrees 45 minutes north, longitude 36 degrees 45 minutes west, we saw a sail which was steering to the west, and the next day we saw three more. End of section 24. Section 25 of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2, by James Cook. Book 4, Chapter 11. Arrival of the Ship at the Island of Fail, a Description of the Place, and the Return of the Resolution to England. 1775, July. At five o'clock in the evening of the 13th, we made the island of Fail, one of the Azores, and soon after that of Pico, under which we spent the night in making short boards. At daybreak the next morning, we bore away for the Bay of Fail, or de Horta, where at eight o'clock we anchored in twenty fathoms water, a clear sandy bottom, and something more than half a mile from the shore. Here we moored northeast and southwest, being directed so to do by the master of the port, who came on board before we dropped anchor. When moored, the southwest point of the bay bore south 16 degrees west, and the northeast point north 33 degrees east. The church at the northeast end of the town, north 38 degrees west, the west point of St. George's Island, north 42 degrees east, distant 8 leagues, and the Isle of Pico extending from north 74 degrees east to south 46 degrees east, distant 4 or 5 miles. We found in the bay the Poor Voyeur, a large French frigate, an American sloop, and a brig belonging to the place. She had come last from the river Amazon, where she took in a cargo of provisions from the Cape Verde Islands, but not being able to find them, she steered for this place, where she anchored about half an hour before us. As my sole design in stopping here was to give Mr. Wales an opportunity to find the rate of the watch, the better to enable us to fix with some degree of certainty the longitude of these islands. The moment we anchored, 
I sent an officer to wait on the English consul and to notify our arrival to the governor, requesting his permission for Mr. Wales to make observations on shore for the purpose above mentioned. Mr. Dent, who acted as consul in the absence of Mr. Gathorne, not only procured this permission, but accommodated Mr. Wales with a convenient place in his garden to set up his instruments so that he was enabled to observe equal altitudes the same day. We were not more obliged to Mr. Dent for the very friendly readiness he showed in procuring us this and every other thing we wanted than for the very liberal and hospitable entertainment we met with at his house, which was open to accommodate us both day and night. During our stay, the ship's company was served with fresh beef, and we took on board about 15 tons of water, which we bought off in the country boats at the rate of about three shillings per ton. Ships are allowed to water with their own boats, but the many inconveniences attending it more than overbalance the expense of hiring shore boats, which is the most general custom. Fresh provisions for present use may be got, such as beef, vegetables and fruit, and hogs, sheep and poultry for sea stock, all at a pretty reasonable price, but I do not know that any sea provisions are to be had, except wine. The bullocks and hogs are very good, but the sheep are small and wretchedly poor. The principal produce of Fail is wheat and Indian corn, with which they supply Pico and some of the other isles. The chief town is called Villa de Horta. It is situated in the bottom of the bay, close to the edge of the sea, and is defended by two castles, one at each end of the town, and a wall of stonework extending along the seashore from the one to the other. But these works are suffered to go to decay and serve more for show than strength. They heighten the prospect of the city, which makes a fine appearance from the road. But if we accept the Jesuits' college, the monasteries and churches, there is not another building that has anything to recommend it, either outside or in. There is not a glass window in the place, except water in the churches, and in a country house, which lately belonged to the English consul, all the others being latticed, which, to an Englishman, makes them look like prisons. This little city, like all others belonging to the Portuguese, is crowded with religious buildings, there being no less than three convents of men and two of women, and eight churches, including those belonging to the convents, and the one in the Jesuits' college. This college is a fine structure, and is situated on an elevation in the pleasantest part of the city. Since the expulsion of that order, it has been suffered to go to decay, and will probably, in a few years, be no better than a heap of ruins. Fail although the most noted for wines, does not raise sufficient for its own consumption. This article is raised on Pico, where there is no road for shipping, but being brought to De Horta, and from thence shipped abroad, chiefly to America, it has acquired the name of Fail Wine. The bay, or road of Fail, is situated at the east end of the isle, before the villa de Horta, and facing the west end of Pico. It is two miles broad and three quarters of a mile deep, and hath a semicircular form. The depth of water is from twenty to ten, and even six fathoms, a sandy bottom, except near the shore, and particularly near the southwest head, off which the bottom is rocky, also without the line which joins the two points of the bay so that it is not safe to anchor far out. The bearing before mentioned, taken when at anchor, will direct any one to the best ground. It is by no means a bad road, but the winds most to be apprehended 
are those which blow from between the south southwest and southeast. The former is not so dangerous as the latter, because with it you can always get to sea. Besides this road, there is a small cove round the southwest point called Porto Pierre, in which, I am told, a ship or two may lie in tolerable safety, and where they sometimes heave small vessels down. A Portuguese captain told me that about half a league from the road in the direction of southeast, in a line between it and the south side of Pico, lies a sunken rock, over which is twenty-two feet water, and on which the sea breaks in hard gales from the south. He also assured me that of all the shoals that are laid down in our charts and pilot books about these isles, not one has any existence but the one between the islands of St. Michael and St. Mary, called Hormingen. This account may be believed without relying entirely upon it. He further informed me that it is 45 leagues from Fail to the island of Flores, and that there runs a strong tide between Fail and Pico, the flood setting to the northeast and the ebb to the southwest, but that, out at sea, the direction is east and west. Mr. Wales, having observed the times of high and low water by the shore, concluded that it must be high water at the full and change about twelve o'clock, and the water riseth about four or five feet. The distance between Fail and Flores was confirmed by Mr. Rebiers, lieutenant of the French frigate, who told me that after being by estimation two leagues due south of Flores, they made forty-four leagues on a southeast by east coast by compass to St. Catherine's Point on Fail. I found the latitude of the ship at anchor in the bay, 38 degrees, 31 minutes, 55 seconds north. By a mean of 17 sets of lunar observations, and reduced to the bay by the watch, the longitude was made 28 degrees, 24 minutes, 30 seconds west. By a mean of six sets after leaving it, and reduced by the watch, 28 degrees, 53 minutes, 22 seconds. Longitude by observation, 28 degrees, 38 minutes, 56 seconds. Ditto by the watch, 28 degrees, 55 minutes, 45 seconds. Error of the watch on our arrival at Portsmouth, 16 minutes, 26 and a half seconds. True longitude by the watch, 28 degrees, 39 minutes, 18 and a half seconds. I found the variation of the compass by several azimuths, taken by different compasses on board the ship, to agree very well with the like observations made by Mr. Wales on shore, and yet the variation thus found is greater by five degrees than we found it to be at sea, for the azimuths taken on board the evening before we came into the bay gave no more than 16 degrees, 18 minutes west variation, and the evening after we came out, 17 degrees, 33 minutes west. I shall now give some account of the variation, as observed in our run, from the island of Fernando de Norona to Fail. The least variation we found was 37 minutes west, which was the day after we left Fernando de Norona, and in the latitude of 33 minutes south, longitude 32 degrees 16 minutes west. The next day being nearly in the same longitude, and in the latitude of 1 degree 25 minutes north, it was 1 degree 23 minutes west and we did not find it increase till we got into the latitude of 5 degrees north, longitude 31 degrees west. After this, our compasses gave different variation, viz. from 3 degrees 57 minutes to 5 degrees 11 minutes west, till we arrived in the latitude of 26 degrees 44 minutes north, 
longitude 41 degrees west, when we found 6 degrees west. It then increased gradually, so that in the latitude of 35 degrees north, longitude 40 degrees west, it was 10 degrees 24 minutes west. In the latitude of 38 degrees 12 minutes north, longitude 32 and a half degrees west, it was 14 degrees 47 minutes, and in sight of fail, 16 degrees 18 minutes west, as mentioned above. Having left the bay at four in the morning of the 19th, I steered for the west end of St. George's Island. As soon as we had passed it, I steered east a half south for the island of Tessera, and after having run 13 leagues, we were not more than one league from the west end. I now edged away for the north side, with a view of ranging the coast to the eastern point, in order to ascertain the length of the island. But the weather coming on very thick and hazy, and night approaching, I gave up the design, and proceeded with all expedition for England. On the 29th we made the land near Plymouth. The next morning we anchored at Spithead, and the same day I landed at Portsmouth and set out for London, in company with Messrs. Wales, Forsters and Hodges. Having been absent from England three years and eighteen days, in which time, and under all changes of climate, I lost but four men, and only one of them by sickness, it may not be amiss, at the conclusion of this journal, to enumerate the several causes to which, under the care of Providence, I conceive this uncommon good state of health, experienced by my people, was owing. In the introduction mention has been made of the extraordinary attention paid by the Admiralty in causing such articles to be put on board, as either from experience or suggestion, it was judged would tend to preserve the health of the seamen. I shall not trespass upon the reader's time in mentioning them all, but confine myself to such as were found the most useful. We were furnished with a quantity of malt, of which was made sweet wort. To such of the men as showed the least symptoms of the scurvy, and also to such as were thought to be threatened with that disorder, this was given from one to two or three pints a day each man, or in such proportion as the surgeon found necessary, which sometimes amounted to three quarts. This is, without doubt, one of the best antiscorbutic sea medicines yet discovered, and, if used in time, will, with proper attention to other things, I am persuaded, prevent the scurvy from making any great progress for a considerable while. But I am not altogether of opinion that it will cure it at sea. Sauerkraut, of which we had a large quantity, is not only a wholesome vegetable food, but in my judgment highly antiscorbutic, and it spoils not by keeping. A pound of this was served to each man when at sea, twice a week or oftener, as was thought necessary. Portable broth was another great article, of which we had a large supply. An ounce of this to each man, or such other proportion as circumstances pointed out, was boiled in their peas three days in the week, and when we were in places where vegetables were to be got, it was boiled with them and wheat or oatmeal every morning for breakfast, and also with peas and vegetables for dinner. It enabled us to make several nourishing and wholesome messes, and was the means of making the people eat a greater quantity of vegetables than they would otherwise have done. Rob of lemon and orange is an antiscorbutic we were not without. The surgeon made use of it in many cases with great success. Amongst the articles of victualling, we were supplied with sugar in the room of oil, and with wheat for a part of our oatmeal, and were certainly gainers by the exchange. Sugar, I apprehend, is a very good antiscorbutic, whereas oil, 
such as the navy is usually supplied with, I am of opinion has the contrary effect. But the introduction of the most salutary articles, either as provisions or medicines, will generally prove unsuccessful unless supported by certain regulations. On this principle, many years' experience, together with some hints I had from Sir Hugh Palliser, Captains Campbell, Wallace, and other intelligent officers, enabled me to lay a plan whereby all was to be governed. The crew were at three watches, except on some extraordinary occasions. By this means, they were not so much exposed to the weather as if they had been at watch and watch, and had generally dry clothes to shift themselves when they happened to get wet. Care was also taken to expose them as little to wet weather as possible. Proper methods were used to keep their persons, hammocks, bedding, clothes, etc., constantly clean and dry. Equal care was taken to keep the ship clean and dry betwixt decks. Once or twice a week she was aired with fires, and when this could not be done, she was smoked with gunpowder mixed with vinegar or water. I had also, frequently, a fire made in an iron pot at the bottom of the well, which was of great use in purifying the air in the lower parts of the ship. To this and to cleanliness, as well in the ship as amongst the people, too great attention cannot be paid. The least neglect occasions a putrid and disagreeable smell below, which nothing but fires will remove. Proper attention was paid to the ship's coppers, so that they were kept constantly clean. The fat which boiled out of the salt, beef, and pork, I never suffered to be given to the people, being of opinion that it promotes the scurvy. I was careful to take in water wherever it was to be got, even though we did not want it, because I look upon fresh water from the shore to be more wholesome than that which has been kept some time on board a ship. Of this essential article, we were never at an allowance, but had always plenty for every necessary purpose. Navigators in general cannot, indeed, expect, nor would they wish to meet with such advantages in this respect as fell to my lot. The nature of our voyage carried us into very high latitudes, but the hardships and dangers inseparable from that situation were in some degree compensated by the singular felicity we enjoyed of extracting some inexhaustible supplies of fresh water from an ocean strewed with ice. We came to few places where either the art of man or the bounty of nature had not provided some sort of refreshment or other, either in the animal or vegetable way. It was my first care to procure whatever of any kind could be met with by every means in my power, and to oblige our people to make use thereof, both by my example and authority. But the benefits arising from refreshments of any kind soon became so obvious that I had little occasion to recommend the one or to exert the other. It doth not become me to say how far the principal objects of our voyage have been obtained. Though it hath not abounded with remarkable events, nor been diversified by sudden transitions of fortune, though my relation of it has been more employed in tracing our course by sea than in recording our operations on shore. This, perhaps, is a circumstance from which the curious reader may infer that the purposes for which we were sent into the southern hemisphere were diligently and effectually pursued. Had we found out a continent there, we might have been better enabled to gratify curiosity, but we hope our not having found it, after all our persevering researches, will leave less room for future speculation about unknown worlds remaining to be explored. 
But whatever may be the public judgment about other matters, it is with real satisfaction and without claiming any merit but that of attention to my duty that I can conclude this account with an observation which facts enable me to make that our having discovered the possibility of preserving health amongst a numerous ship's company for such a length of time in such varieties of climate and amidst such continued hardships and fatigues will make this voyage remarkable in the opinion of every benevolent person when the disputes about the southern continent shall have ceased to engage the attention and to divide the judgment of philosophers End of section 25section 26 of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume 2 by james cook appendices part 1 Letter from John Ibbotson, Esquire, Secretary to the Commissioners of Longitude, to Sir John Pringle, Baronet, President of the Royal Society. Sir, the Earl of Sandwich and the other Commissioners for the discovery of longitude at sea, etc., who were present at a late meeting at this place, having expressed to you a desire that the very learned and ingenious discourse upon some late improvements of the means for preserving the health of mariners which was delivered to you at the anniversary meeting of the royal society on the thirtieth of november last might with captain cook's paper therein referred to be printed and annexed to the account of the astronomical and philosophical observations made in the course of the said captain cook's late voyages which account is preparing for the press under their direction and it having been since thought more proper that the said discourse and paper should be annexed to the second volume of the account of that voyage which is shortly to be published by order of the board of admiralty i have therefore the direction of the earl of sandwich first commissioner of that board as well as of the board of longitude to acquaint you therewith and to desire you will please to permit your said discourse with the paper therein referred to to be printed and annexed to the second volume of the account of the said voyage accordingly i am with great regard and esteem sir your most obedient humble servant admiralty march fifteenth seventeen seventy seven john ibbotson a discourse upon some late improvements of the means for preserving the health of mariners delivered at the anniversary meeting of the royal society november thirtieth seventeen seventy six by sir john pringle baronet president corrected by the author gentlemen before we proceed further in the business of this day permit me to acquaint you with the judgment of your council in the disposal of sir godfrey copley's medal an office i have undertaken at their request and with the greatest satisfaction as i am confident you will be no less unanimous in giving your approbation than they have been in addressing you for it upon this occasion for though they were not insensible of the just title that several of the papers composing the present volume of your transactions had to your particular notice yet they did not hesitate in preferring that which i presented to you from captain cook giving an account of the method he had taken to preserve the health of the crew of his majesty's ship the resolution during her late voyage round the world footnote 
The paper itself read at the Society in March last, with an extract of a letter from Captain Cook to the President, dated Plymouth, the 7th of July following, are both subjoined to this discourse. End footnote. Indeed, I imagine that the name alone of so worthy a member of this society would have inclined you to depart from the strictness of your rules by conferring upon him that honour, though you had received no direct communication from him. Considering how meritorious in your eyes that person must appear, who hath not only made the most extensive, but the most instructive voyages, who hath not only discovered, but surveyed, vast tracts of new coasts, who hath dispelled the illusion of a terra australis incognita, and fixed the bounds of the habitable earth, as well as those of the navigable ocean in the southern hemisphere. I shall not, however, expatiate on that ample field of praise, but confine my discourse to what was the intention of this honorary premium, namely to crown that paper of the year, which should contain the most useful and most successful experimental inquiry. Now, what inquiry can be so useful as that which hath for its object the saving the lives of men? And when shall we find one more successful than that before us? Here are no vain boastings of the empiric, nor ingenious and delusive theories of the dogmatist, but a concise, an artless, and an incontested relation of the means by which, under the divine favour, Captain Cook, with a company of an hundred and eighteen men, footnote, there were on board in all one hundred and eighteen men, including Monsieur Sparman, whom they took in at the Cape of Good Hope, end footnote, performed a voyage of three years and eighteen days throughout all the climes, from fifty-two degrees north to seventy-one degrees south, with the loss of only one man by a distemper. Footnote. This was a thesis pulmonalis terminating in a dropsy. Mr. Patton, surgeon to the resolution, who mentioned to me this case, observed that this man began so early to complain of a cough and other consumptive symptoms which had never left him, that his lungs must have been affected before he came on board. End footnote. What must enhance to us the value of these salutary observations is to see the practice hath been no less simple than efficacious. I would now inquire of the most conversant in the study of bills of mortality, whether in the most healthful climate and in the best condition of life, they have ever found so small a number of deaths in such a number of men within that space of time. How great and agreeable, then, must our surprise be, after perusing the histories of lung navigations in former days, when so many perished by marine diseases, to find the air of the sea acquitted of all malignity, and in fine that a voyage round the world may be undertaken with less danger to health than a common tour of Europe. But the better to see the contrast between the old and the present times, allow me to recall to your memory what you have read of the first voyage for the establishment of the East India Company. Footnote. This squadron under the command of Lancaster, who was called the General, set out in the year 1601. See Purchases Pilgrims, Volume 1, page 147, etc. End footnote. The equipment consisting of four ships with 480 men, three of those vessels were so weakened by the scurvy, by the time they had got only three degrees beyond the line, that the merchants who had embarked on this adventure were obliged to do duty as common sailors, and there died in all at sea 
and on shore at Soldania, a place of refreshment on this side the Cape of Good Hope, 105 men, which was near a fourth part of their complement. And hath not Sir Richard Hawkins, an intelligent as well as brave officer, who lived in that age, recorded that in twenty years, during which he had used the sea, he could give an account of ten thousand mariners who had been consumed by the scurvy alone. Footnote, idem, volume four, page one three seven three et sec. End footnote. Yet so far was this author from mistaking the disease that I have perused few who have so well described it. If then in those early times the infancy I may call them of the commerce and naval power of England so many were carried off by that bane of seafaring people what must have been the destruction afterwards upon the great augmentation of the fleet and the opening of so many new ports to the trade of great britain whilst so little advancement was made in the nautical part of medicine but passing from these old dates to one within the remembrance of many here present when it might have been expected that whatever tended to aggrandize the naval power of Britain and to extend her commerce would have received the highest improvement, yet we shall find that even at this late period few measures had been taken to preserve the health of seamen more than had been known to our uninstructed ancestors. Of this assertion, the victorious but mournful expedition of Commodore Anson offers too convincing a proof. It is well known that soon after passing the Straits of La Mer, the scurvy began to appear in his squadron, that by the time the centurion had advanced but a little way into the South Sea, forty-seven had died of it in his ship, and that there were few on board who had not, in some degree, been afflicted with the distemper, though they had not been then eight months from England, that in the ninth month, when standing for the island of Juan Fernandez, the centurion lost double that number, and that the mortality went on at so great a rate, I still speak of the Commodore's ship, that before they arrived there she had buried two hundred, and at last could muster no more than six of the common men in a watch capable of doing duty. This was the condition of one of the three ships which reached that island. The other two suffered in proportion. Nor did the tragedy end here, for after a few months' respite, the same fatal sickness broke out afresh and made such havoc that before the centurion, which now contained the whole surviving crew of the three ships, had got to the island of Tinian, there died sometimes eight or ten in a day, insomuch that when they had been only two years on their voyage, they had lost a larger proportion than of four in five of their original number, and by the account of the historian, all of them, after their entering the South Sea of the scurvy, I say by the account of the elegant writer of this voyage, for as he neither was in the medical line himself, nor hath authenticated this part of his narrative by appealing to the surgeons of the ship or their journals, I should doubt that this was not strictly the case, but rather that in producing this great mortality, a pestilential kind of distemper was joined to the scurvy, which from the places where it most frequently occurs, hath been distinguished by the name of jail or hospital fever. Footnote. Dr. Mead, who had seen the original observations of two of Commodore Anson's surgeons, says that the scurvy at that time was accompanied with putrid fevers, etc. See his treatise on the scurvy, page 98, et sec. End footnote. But whether the scurvy alone or this fever combined with it were the cause, 
It is not at present material to inquire, since both, arising from foul air and other sources of putrefaction, may now in a great measure be obviated by the various means fallen upon since Lord Anson's expedition. For in justice to that prudent as well as brave commander, it must be observed that the arrangements preparatory to his voyage were not made by himself, that his ship was so deeply laden as not to admit of opening the gun ports, except in the calmest weather, for the benefit of air, and that nothing appears to have been neglected by him for preserving the health of his men that was then known and practised in the navy. I should now proceed to enumerate the chief improvements made since that period, and which have enabled our ships to make so many successful circumnavigations, as in a manner to efface the impression of former disasters. But as I have mentioned the sickness most destructive to mariners, and against the ravages of which those preservatives have been mainly contrived, it may be proper briefly to explain its nature, and the rather as, unless among mariners, it is little understood. First, then, I would observe that the scurvy is not the ailment which goes by that name on shore. The distemper, commonly but erroneously, in this place called the scurvy, belongs to a class of diseases totally different from what we are now treating of, and so far is the commonly received opinion that there are few constitutions altogether free from a scorbutic taint from being true, that unless among sailors and some others circumstance like them, more particularly with respect to those who use a salt and putrid diet, and especially if they live in foul air and uncleanliness, I have reason to believe there are few disorders less frequent. This opinion I submitted to the judgment of the society several years ago, and I have had no reason since to alter it. I then said, contrary to what was generally believed, but seemingly on the best grounds, that the sea air was never the cause of the scurvy since on board a ship on the longest voyages cleanliness ventilation and fresh provisions would preserve from it and that upon a sea coast free from marshes the inhabitants were not liable to that indisposition though frequently breathing the air from the sea footnote diseases of the army part one chapter two appendix paper seven End footnote. I concluded with joining in sentiments with those who ascribed the scurvy to a septic resolution that is a beginning corruption of the whole habit, similar to that of every animal substance when deprived of life. Footnote. Woodall Surgeon's Mate, page 163. Poor part, Memoir de l'Academie, R. de Science, A. Petit mal des os, tome 2, page 446, Mead on the scurvy, page 104, end footnote. This account seemed to be sufficiently verified by the examination of the symptoms in the scorbutic sick and the appearances in their bodies after death. On that occasion, I remarked that salted meats after some time become in effect putrid, though they may continue long palatable by means of the salt, and that common salt, supposed to be one of the strongest preservatives from corruption, is at best but an indifferent one, even in a large quantity, and in a small one, such as we use at table with fresh meats, or swallowing meats that have been salted, so far from impeding putrefaction, it rather promotes that process in the body. This position concerning the putrefying quality of sea salt in certain proportions hath been since confirmed by the experiments of the late Mr. Canton, fellow of this society, 
in his paper on the cause of the luminous appearance of sea water. Footnote, Philosophical Transactions, Volume 59, page 446, end footnote. It hath been alleged that the scurvy is much owing to the coldness of the air, which checks perspiration, and on that account is the endemic distemper of the northern nations, particularly of those around the Baltic. Footnote, Bartholin, Med Danor Domestic, page 98. End footnote. The fact is partly true, but I doubt not so the cause. In those regions, by the long and severe winters, the cattle, destitute of pasture, can barely live, and are therefore unfit for use, so that the people, for their provision during that season, are obliged to slaughter them by the end of autumn, and to salt them for above half the year. This putrid diet, then, on which they must subsist so long, and to which the inhabitants of the south are not reduced, seems to be the chief cause of the disease. And if we reflect that the lower people of the north have few or no greens nor fruit in the winter, scarce any fermented liquors, and often live in damp, foul, and ill-aired houses, it is easy to conceive how they should become liable to the same distemper with seamen whilst others of as high a latitude, but who live in a different manner, keep free from it. Thus we are informed by Linnaeus that the Laplanders, one of the most hyperborean nations, know nothing of the scurvy. Footnote. Linnae Flora Laponica, pages 8 and 9. End footnote. For which no other reason can be assigned than they are never eating salted meats, nor indeed salt with anything, but they are using all the winter the fresh flesh of their reindeer. This exemption of the Laplanders from the general distemper of the north is the more observable, as they seldom taste vegetables, bread never, as we farther learn from that celebrated author. Yet in the very provinces which border on Lapland, where they use bread, but scarcely any other vegetable, and eat salted meats. They are as much troubled with the scurvy as in any other country. Footnote. Linnaeus, in several parts of his work, confirms what is here said of salted meats as one of the chief causes of the scurvy. See Amern Itat, Akkad, Volume 5, Page 6, et sec page 42. End footnote. But let us incidentally remark that the late improvements in agriculture, gardening, and the other arts of life, by extending their influence to the remotest parts of Europe and to the lowest people, begin sensibly to lessen the frequency of that complaint, even in those climes that have been once the most afflicted with it. It hath also been asserted that men living on shore will be affected with the scurvy, though they have never been confined to salted meats. But of this I have never known any instance, except in those who breathed a marshy air, or what was otherwise putrid, and who wanted exercise, fruits and green vegetables. Under such circumstances it must be granted that the humours will corrupt in the same manner, though not in the same degree, with those of mariners. Thus, in the late war, when Sissinghurst Castle in Kent was filled with French prisoners, the scurvy broke out among them, notwithstanding that they had never been served with salted victuals in England, but had daily had an allowance of fresh meat and of bread in proportion, though without greens or any other vegetable. The surgeon who attended them, and from whom I received this information, having formerly been employed in the navy, was the better able to judge of the disorder and to cure it. Besides the deficiency of herbs, he observed that the wards were foul and crowded, the house damp, 
from a moat that surrounded it, and that the bounds allotted for taking the air were so small and in wet weather so sloughy that the men seldom went out. He added that a representation having been made, he had been empowered to furnish the prisoners with roots and greens for boiling in their soup, and to quarter the sick in a neighbouring village, in a dry situation, with liberty to go out for air and exercise, and that by these means they had all quickly recovered. It is probable that the scurvy sooner appeared among these strangers from their having been taken at sea and consequently more disposed to the disease. My informer further acquainted me that in the lower and wetter parts of that county, where some of his practice lay, he had now and then met with slighter cases of the scurvy among the common people, such, he said, as live the whole winter on salted bacon, without fermented liquors, greens or fruit, a few apples excepted. But, he remarked, that in the winters following a plentiful growth of apples, those peasants were visibly less liable to the disorder. I have dwelt the longer on this part of my subject, as I look upon the knowledge of the nature and cause of the scurvy to be an essential step towards improving the means of prevention and cure. And I am persuaded after mature reflection and at the opportunities I have had of conversing with those who, to much sagacity, have joined no small experience in nautical practice, that upon an examination of the several articles which have either been of old approven or have of late been introduced into the navy, it will be evident that though these means may vary in form and in their mode of operating, yet they all some way contribute towards preventing or correcting putrefaction, whether of the air in the closer parts of a ship, of the meats, of the water, of the clothes and bedding, or of the body itself. And if in this inquiry, which may be made by the way, whilst we take a review of the principal articles of provision, and other methods used by Captain Cook to guard against the scurvy, I say, if in this inquiry it shall appear that the notion of a septic or putrid origin is not without foundation, it will be no small encouragement to proceed on that principle in order further to improve this important branch of medicine. Captain Cook begins his list of stores with malt, of this, he says, was made sweet wort, and given not only to those men who had manifest symptoms of the scurvy, but to such also as were judged to be most liable to it. Dr. McBride, who first suggested this preparation, was led, as he says, to the discovery by some experiments that had been laid before this society by which it appeared that the air produced by alimentary fermentation was endowed with the power of correcting putrefaction. Footnote. Appendix to my observations on the diseases of the army. End footnote. The fact he confirmed by numerous trials, and finding this fluid to be fixed air, he justly concluded that whatever substance proper for food abounded with it, and which could be conveniently carried to sea, would make one of the best provisions against the scurvy, which he then considered as a putrid disease, and as such to be prevented or cured by that powerful kind of antiseptic. Footnote. McBride's Experimental Effects Pass In End footnote. Beer, for instance, has always been esteemed one of the best antiscorbutics, but as that derived all its fixed air from the malt of which it is made, he inferred that malt itself was preferable in long voyages, as it took up less room than the brewed liquor and would keep longer found. Experience hath since verified this ingenious theory 
and the malt hath now gained so much credit in the navy that there only wanted so long so healthful and so celebrated a voyage as this to rank it among the most indispensable articles of provision for although captain cook remarks that a proper attention to other things must be joined and that he is not altogether of opinion that the wort will be able to cure the scurvy in an advanced state at sea yet he is persuaded that it is sufficient to prevent that distemper from making any great progress for a considerable time and therefore he doth not hesitate to pronounce it one of the best antiscorbutic medicines yet found out footnote having been favoured with a sight of the medical journal of mr patton surgeon to the resolution i read the following passage in it not a little strengthening the above testimony i have found the wort of the utmost service in all scorbutic cases during the voyage as many took it by way of prevention few cases occurred when it had a fair trial but theft however i flatter myself will be sufficient to convince every impartial person that it is the best remedy hitherto found out for the cure of the sea scurvy and i am well convinced from what i have seen the word perform and from its mode of operation that if aided by portable soup sauerkraut sugar sago and currants then scurvy that maritime pestilence will seldom or never make its alarming appearance among a ship's crew on the longest voyages proper care with regard to cleanliness and provisions being observed End footnote. this salutary gas or fixed air is contained more or less in all fermentable liquors and begins to oppose putrefaction as soon as the working or intestine motion commences in wine it abounds and perhaps no vegetable substance is more replete with it than the juice of the grape if we join the grateful taste of wine we must rank it the first in the list of antiscorbutic liquors cider is likewise good with other vinous productions from fruit as also the various kinds of beer it hath been a constant observation that in long cruises or distant voyages the scurvy is never seen whilst the small beer holds out at a full allowance but that when it is all expended that ailment soon appears it were therefore to be wished that this most wholesome beverage could be renewed at sea but our ships afford not sufficient convenience the russians however make a shift to prepare on board as well as at land a liquor of a middle quality between wort and small beer in the following manner they take ground malt and rye meal in a certain proportion which they knead into small loaves and bake in the oven these they occasionally infuse in a proper quantity of warm water which begins so soon to ferment that in the space of twenty-four hours their brewage is completed in the production of a small brisk and acidulous liquor they call quass palatable to themselves and not disagreeable to the taste of strangers the late dr munsey fellow of this society who had lived long in russia and had been architer under two successive sovereigns acquainted me that the quass was the common and wholesome drink both of the fleets and armies of that empire and that it was particularly good against the scurvy he added that happening to be at moscow when he perused my observations on the jail and hospital fever then lately published footnote that treatise was first published by itself and afterwards incorporated with the observations on the diseases of the army End footnote. he had been induced to compare what he read in that treatise with what he should see in the several provisions of that large city 
but to his surprise after visiting them all and finding them full of malefactors for the late empress then suffered none of those who were convicted of capital crimes to be put to death yet he could discover no fever among them nor learn that any acute distemper peculiar to jails had ever been known there he observed that some of those places of confinement had a yard into which the prisoners were allowed to come for the air but that there were others without that advantage yet not sickly so that he could assign no other reason for the healthful condition of those men than the kind of diet they used which was the same with that of the common people of the country who not being able to purchase fresh meat live mostly on rye bread the most acescent of any and drink quass he concluded with saying that upon his return to st petersburg he had made the same inquiry there and with the same result end of section twenty six section twenty seven of a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a voyage towards the south pole and round the world volume two by james cook appendices part two discourse of sir john pringle president of the royal society continued thus far dr munsey from whose account it would seem that the rye meal assisted both in quickening the fermentation and adding more fixed air since the malt alone could not so readily produce so tart and brisk a liquor and there is little doubt but that whenever the other grains can be brought to a proper degree of fermentation they will more or less in the same way become useful that oats will i am satisfied from what i have been told by one of the intelligent friends of captain cook this gentleman being on a cruise in a large ship footnote the essex a seventy gun ship end footnote in the beginning of the late war and the scurvy breaking out among his crew he bethought himself of a kind of food he had seen used in some parts of the country as the most proper on the occasion some oatmeal is put into a wooden vessel hot water is poured upon it and the infusion continues until the liquor begins to taste sourish that is till a fermentation comes on which in a place moderately warm may be in the space of two days the water is then poured off from the grounds and boiled down to the consistence of a jelly footnote this rural food in the north is called swins End footnote. this he ordered to be made and dealt out in messes being first sweetened with sugar and seasoned with some prize french wine which though turned sour yet improved the taste and made this ailment not less palatable than medicinal he assured me that upon this diet chiefly and by abstaining from salted meats his scorbutic sick had quite recovered on board and not in that voyage only but by the same means in his subsequent cruises during the war without his being obliged to send one of them on shore because they could not get well at sea yet oatmeal unfermented like barley unmalted hath no sensible effect in curing the scurvy as if the fixed air which is incorporated with these grains could mixed with the chyle which they produce enter the lacteals and make part of the nourishment of the body without manifesting any elastic or antiseptic quality when not loosened by a previous fermentation 
before the power of the fixed air in subduing putrefaction was known the efficacy of fruits greens and fermented liquors was commonly ascribed to the acid in their composition and we have still reason to believe that the acid concurs in operating that effect if it be alleged that mineral acids which contain little or no fixed air have been tried in the scurvy with little success i would answer that i doubt that in those trials they have never been sufficiently diluted for it is easy to conceive that in the small quantity of water the elixir of vitriol for instance is commonly given that austere acid can scarce get beyond the first passages considering the delicate sensibility of the mouths of the lacteals which must force them to shut and exclude so pungent a liquor it was therefore a proper experiment to be made in a deficiency of malt or when that grain shall happen to be spoilt by keeping footnote captain cook told me that the malt held out sufficiently good for the two first years but that in the third having lost much of its taste he doubted whether it retained any of its virtues mr patton however observed that though the malt at that time was sensibly decayed yet none the less he had still found it useful when he employed a large proportion of it to make the infusion End footnote. to use water acidulated with the spirit of the sea salt in the proportion of only ten drops to a quart or with the weak spirit of vitriol thirteen drops to the same measure footnote in these proportions i found the water taste just acidulous and pleasant End footnote. and to give to those that are threatened with the disease three quarts of this liquor daily to be consumed as they shall think proper but if the fixed air and acids are such preservatives against the scurvy why should captain cook make so little account of the rob of lemons and oranges for so they have called the extracts or inspissated juices of those fruits in treating that distemper this i found was the reason these preparations being only sent out upon trial the surgeon of the ship was told at a conjecture how much he might give for a dose but without strictly limiting it the experiment was made with a quantity specified but with so little advantage that judging it not advisable to lose more time he set about the cure with the wort only whereof the efficacy he was certain whereas he reserved these robs for other purposes more particularly for coals when to a large draught of warm water with some spirits and sugar he added a spoonful of one of them and with this composition made a grateful sodorific that answered the intention no wonder then if captain cook not knowing the proper dose of these concentrated juices for the scurvy but seeing them fail as they were given in the trial should entertain no great opinion of their antiscorbutic virtue it may be also proper to take notice that as they had been reduced to a small proportion of their bulk by evaporation upon fire it is probable they were much weakened by that process and that with their aqueous parts they had lost not a little of their aerial on which so much of their antiseptic power depended if therefore a further trial of these excellent fruits were to be made it would seem more advisable to send to sea the purified juices entire in casks agreeable to a proposal i find hath been made to the admiralty some years ago by an ingenious and experienced surgeon of the navy for in truth the testimonies in favour of the salutary qualities of these acids are so numerous and so strong that i should look upon some failures even in cases where their want of success cannot so well be accounted for as in this voyage 
not a sufficient reason for striking them out of the list of the most powerful preservatives against this consuming malady of sailors it may be observed that captain cook says not more in praise of vinegar than of the robs yet i would not thence infer that he made no account of that acid but only that he happened in this voyage to be sparingly provided with it and yet did well he could not consider a large store of vinegar to be so material an article of provision as was commonly imagined and though he supplied its place in the messes of the men with the acid of the sauerkraut and trusted chiefly to fire for purifying his dicks yet it is to be hoped that future navigators will not therefore omit it vinegar will serve at least for a wholesome variety in the seasoning of salted meats and may be sometimes successfully used as a medicine especially in the aspersions of the births of the sick it is observable that though the smell be little grateful to a person in health yet it is commonly agreeable to those who are sick at least to such as are confined to a foul and crowded ward there the physician himself will smell to vinegar as much for pleasure as for guarding against infection now the wort and the acid juices were only dispensed as medicines but the next article was of more extensive use this was the sauerkraut sour cabbage a food of universal request in germany the acidity is acquired by its spontaneous fermentation and it was the sour taste which made it the more acceptable to all who ate it to its further commendation we may add that it held out good to the last of the voyage it may seem strange that though this herb hath had so high encomiums bestowed upon it by the ancients witness what cato the elder and pliny the naturalist say on the subject and hath had the sanction of the experience of nations for ages it should yet be disapproved of by some of the most distinguished medical writers of our times one finds it yield a rank smell in decoction which he confounds with that of putrefaction another analyzes it and discovers so much gross air in the composition as to render it indigestible yet this flatulence so much decried must now be acknowledged to be the fixed air which makes the cabbage so wholesome when fermented nay it hath been traduced by one of the most celebrated physicians of our age as partaking of a poisonous nature nor much better founded was that notion of the same illustrious professor that cabbage being an alkalescent plant and therefore disposing to putrefaction could never be used in the scurvy except when the disease proceeded from an acid but the experiments which i formerly laid before the society evince this vegetable with the rest of the supposed alkalescence to be really acescent and prove that the scurvy is never owing to acidity but much otherwise to a species of putrefaction that very cause of which the ill-grounded class of alkalescence were supposed to be a promoter footnote see my remark more at large in my observations on the diseases of the army appendix paper seven End footnote. among other of the late improvements of the naval stores we have heard much of the portable soup and accordingly we find that captain cook hath not a little availed himself of it in his voyage this concentrated broth being freed from all fat and having by long boiling evaporated the most putrescent parts of the meat is reduced to the consistence of a glue which in effect it is and will like other glues in a dry place keep sound for years together it hath been said that broths turn sour on keeping though made without any vegetable footnote 
la fin matière qui s'agriffe dans la sang et la matière euh, gelatine couse, etc. Sénèque, structure de cœur, part 1, subpart 3, chapter 4, paragraph 5, end footnote. Now, whether any real acid can be thus formed or not, I incline at least to believe that the gelatinous parts of animal substances, such as compose these cakes, are not of a nature much disposed to putrefy. But however that may be, since Captain Cook observes that this soup was the means of making his people eat a greater quantity of greens than they would have done otherwise, in so far we must allow it to have been virtually antiseptic. So much for those articles that have of late been supplied to all the king's ships on long voyages, and in which therefore our worthy brother claims no other merit than the prudent dispensation of them. But what follows being regulations either wholly new or improven hints from some of his experienced friends, we may justly appropriate them to himself. First, then, he put his people at three watches instead of two, which last is the general practice at sea. That is, he divided the whole crew into three companies, and by putting each company upon the watch by turns, four hours at a time, every man had eight hours free for four of duty, whereas at watch and watch, the half of the men being on duty at once, with returns of it every four hours, they can have but broken sleep, and, when exposed to wet, they have not time to get dry before they lie down. When the service requires it, such hardships must be endured. But when there is no pressing call, ought not a mariner to be refreshed with as much uninterrupted rest as a common day labourer? I am well informed that an officer distinguishes himself in nothing more than in preserving his men from wet and the other injuries of the weather. These were most essential points with this humane commander. In the torrid zone he shaded his people from the scorching sun by an awning over his deck, and in his course under the Antarctic Circle he had a coat provided for every man of a substantial woolen stuff, with the addition of a hood for covering their heads. This garb, which the sailors called their Magellan jacket, they occasionally wore, and found it more comfortable for working in rain and snow, and among the broken ice in the high latitudes of the south. Let us proceed to another article, one of the most material, the care to guard against putrefaction, by keeping clean the persons, the clothes, bedding, and berths of the sailors. The captain acquainted me that regularly, one morning in the week, he passed his ship's company in review, and saw that every man had changed his linen, and was in other points as clean and neat as circumstances would permit. It is well known how much cleanliness is conducive to health but it is not so obvious how much it also tends to good order and other virtues. That diligent officer was persuaded, nor was perhaps the observation new, that such men as he could induce to be more cleanly than they were disposed to be of themselves, became at the same time more sober, more orderly, and more attentive to their duty. It must be acknowledged that a seaman has but indifferent means to keep himself clean, had he the greatest inclination to do it, for I have not heard that commanders of ships have yet availed themselves of the still for providing fresh water for washing, and it is well known that sea water doth not mix with soap, and that linen wet with brine never thoroughly dries. But for Captain Cook, the frequent opportunities he had of taking in water among the islands of the South Sea enabled him in that tract to dispense to his ship's company some fresh water for every use, 
and when he navigated in the high latitudes of the southern oceans, he still more abundantly provided them with it, as you will find by the sequel of this discourse. Of the hammocks and bedding I need say little, as all officers are now sensible how much it concerns the health of their people to have this part of a ship's furniture kept dry and well aired, since by the perspiration of so many men, everything below, even in the space of twenty-four hours, is apt to contract an offensive moisture. But Captain Cook was not satisfied with ordering upon deck the hammocks and bedding every day that was fair, the common method, but took care that every bundle should be unlashed and so spread out that every part of it might be exposed to the air. His next concern was to see to the purity of the ship itself, without which attention all the rest would have profited little. I shall not, however, detain you with the orders about washing and scraping the decks, as I do not understand that in this kind of cleansing he excelled others. But since our author has laid so great a stress upon fire as a purifier, I shall endeavour to explain the way of using it more fully than he has done in his paper. Some wood, and that not sparingly, being put into a proper stove or grate, is lighted and carried successively to every part below deck. Wherever fire is, the air nearest to it being heated becomes specifically lighter, and by being lighter rises and passes through the hatchways into the atmosphere. The vacant space is filled with the cold air around, and that being heated in its turn in like manner ascends and is replaced by other air as before. Thus, by continuing the fire for some time, in any of the lower apartments, the foul air is in a good measure driven out and the fresh admitted. This is not all. I apprehend that the acid steams of the wood in burning act here as an antiseptic and correct the corrupted air that remains. An officer of distinguished rank, another of Captain Cook's experienced friends, mentioned to me a common and just observation in the fleet, which was that all the old twenty-gun ships were remarkably less sickly than those of the same size of a modern construction. This, he said, was a circumstance he could not otherwise account for than by the former having their galley, footnote, their fireplace or kitchen, end footnote, in the forepart of the orlop, footnote, the deck immediately above the hold, end footnote, the chimney vented so ill that it was sure to fill every part with smoke whenever the wind was astern. This was a nuisance for the time, but as he thought, abundantly compensated by the extraordinary good health of the several crews. Possibly those fireplaces were also beneficial by drying and ventilating the lower decks, more when they were below than they can do now, that they are placed under the forecastle upon the upper deck. But the most obvious use of the portable fires was their drying up the moisture, and especially in those places where there was the least circulation of air. This humidity composed of the perspirable matter of a multitude of men, and often of animals, kept for a live flock, and of the steams of the bilge water from the well, where the corruption is the greatest. This putrid moisture, I say, being one of the main sources of the scurvy, was therefore more particularly attended to in order to its removal. The fires were the powerful instrument for that purpose, and whilst they burned, some men were employed in rubbing hard, with canvas or oakum, every part of the inside of the ship that was damp and accessible. But the advantage of fire appears nowhere so manifest as in cleansing the well, for this being in the lowest part of the hold, the whole leakage runs into it, whether of the ship itself, or of the casks of spoiled meats, 
or corrupted water. The mephitic vapours from this sink alone have often been the cause of instantaneous death to those who have unwarily approached to clean it, and not to one only, but to several successively, when they have gone down to succour their unfortunate companions. Yet this very place has not only been rendered safe, but sweet, by means of an iron pot filled with fire and let down to burn in it. When, from the circumstances of the weather, this salutary operation could not take place, the ship was fumigated with gunpowder, as described in the paper, though that smoke could have no effect in drying, but only in remedying the corruption of the air by means of the acid spirits from the sulphur and nitre, aided perhaps by some species of an aerial fluid, then disengaged from the fuel to counter putrefaction. But as these purifications by gunpowder, as well as by burning tar and other resinous substances, are sufficiently known, I shall not insist longer on them here. Among the several means of sweetening or renewing the air, we should expect to hear of Dr. Hales's ventilator. I must confess it was my expectation, and therefore persuaded as I was of the excellence of the invention. It was not without much regret that I saw so good an opportunity lost of giving the same favourable impression of it to the public. If a degree of success exceeding our most sanguine hopes is not sufficient for justifying the omission of a measure, deemed one of the most essential for attaining an end, I would plead in favour of our worthy brother that by a humiliating fatality, so often accompanying the most useful discoveries, the credit of this ventilator is yet far from being firmly established in the Navy. What wonder then, if Captain Cook, being so much otherwise taken up, should not have had time to examine it, and therefore avoided the encumbering his ship with an apparatus he had possibly never seen used, and of which he had at best received but a doubtful character. Nor was he altogether unprovided with a machine for ventilation. He had the wind sails, though he hath not mentioned them in his paper, and he told me that he had found them at times very serviceable, and particularly between the tropics. They have the merit of taking up little room, they require no labour in working, and the contrivance is so simple that they can sail in no hands. But their powers are small in comparison with those of the ventilator. They cannot be put up in hard gales of wind, and they are of no efficacy in dead calms when a refreshment of the air is most wanted, should there be any objection to the employing both. Such were the measures taken by our sagacious navigator for procuring a purity of air. It remains only to see in what manner he supplied pure water, another article of so great moment that the thirsty voyager upon his salt and putrid diet, with a short allowance of this element, and that in a corrupted state, must account a plentiful provision of fresh water to be indeed the best of things. Captain Cook was not without an apparatus for distilling sea water, and though he could not obtain nearly so much as was expected from the invention, yet he sometimes availed himself of it, but for the most of his voyage he was otherwise provided. Within the southern tropic in the Pacific Ocean he found so many islands, and those so well stored with springs, that, as I have hinted before, he seldom was without a sufficiency of fresh water for every useful purpose. But not satisfied with plenty, he would have the purest, and therefore whenever an opportunity offered, he emptied what he had taken in but a few days before, and filled his casks anew. But was he not above four months in his passage, from the Cape of Good Hope to New Zealand, 
in the frozen zone of the south without once seeing land and did he not actually complete his circumnavigation in that high latitude without the benefit of a single fountain here was indeed a wonder of the deep i may call it the romance of his voyage those very shoals fields and floating mountains of ice among which he steered his perilous course and which presented such terrifying prospects of destruction those i say were the very means of his support by supplying him abundantly with what he most wanted it had been said that those stupendous masses of ice called islands or mountains melted into fresh water though Kranz, the relator of that paradox, did not imagine they originated from the sea, but that they were first formed in the great rivers of the north, and being carried down into the ocean, were afterwards increased to that amazing height by the snow that fell upon them. Footnote, History of Greenland, B1, Chapter 2, Paragraphs 11 and 12. End footnote. But that all frozen sea water would thaw into fresh had either never been asserted or had met with little credit. This is certain that Captain Cook expected no such transmutation and therefore was agreeably surprised to find he had one difficulty less to encounter that of preserving the health of his men so long on salt provisions with a scanty allowance of corrupted water or what he could procure by distillation the melted ice of the sea was not only fresh but soft and so wholesome as to show the fallacy of human reason unsupported by experiments an ancient of great authority had assigned from theory bad qualities to melted snow and from that period to the present time this prejudice extended to ice had not been quite removed in this circumnavigation amid sleets and falls of snow fogs and much moist weather the resolution enjoyed nearly the same good state of health she had done in the temperate and torrid zones it appears only from the journal of the surgeon that towards the end of the first course footnote viz the voyage between the cape of good hope and new zealand end footnote some of the crew began to complain of the scurvy but the disease made little progress except in one who had become early an invalid from another cause the other disorders were likewise inconsiderable such as common colds slight diarrhoeas and intermittence that readily yielded to the bark there were also some fevers of a continued form but which by timely care never rose to an alarming height much commendation is therefore due to the attention and abilities of mr patton the surgeon of the resolution for having so well seconded his captain in the discharge of his duty for it must be allowed that in despite of the best regulations and the best provisions there will always be among a numerous crew during a long voyage some casualties more or less productive of sickness and that unless there be an intelligent medical assistant on board many under the wisest command will perish that otherwise might have been saved these gentlemen are the reflections i had to lay before you on this interesting subject and if i have encroached on your time you will recollect that much of my discourse hath been employed in explaining some things but just mentioned by captain cook and in adding other materials which i had procured partly from himself and partly after his departure from those intelligent friends he alludes to in his paper this was my plan which as i have now executed you will please to return your thanks to those gentlemen who on your account so cheerfully communicated to me their observations as to your acknowledgments to captain cook and your high opinion of his deserts 
you will best testify them by the honourable distinction suggested by your counsel in presenting him with this medal, for I need not gather your suffrages, since the attention with which you have favoured me hath abundantly expressed your approbation. My satisfaction therefore had been complete, had he himself been present to receive the honours you now confer upon him. But you are apprised that our brave and indefatigable brother is at this instant far removed from us, anticipating, I may say, your wonted request on these occasions, by continuing his labours for the advancement of natural knowledge and for the honour of this society as you may be assured that the object of his new enterprise is not less great, perhaps still greater, than either of the former. Allow me then, gentlemen, to deliver this medal, with his unperishing name engraven upon it, into the hands of one who will be happy to receive that trust, and to know that this respectable body, never more cordially nor more meritoriously bestowed, that faithful symbol of their esteem and affection for if rome decreed the civic crown to him who saved the life of a single citizen what wreaths are due to that man who having himself saved many perpetuates in your transactions the means by which britain may now on the most distant voyages preserve numbers of her intrepid sons her mariners who, braving every danger, have so liberally contributed to the fame, to the opulence, and to the maritime empire of their country. Footnote. Here followed Captain Cook's paper, which was presented to the Society, and is inserted in Part 2, Volume 66 of the Philosophical Transactions but as the substance of that publication is now contained in the last pages of captain cook's voyage it was judged unnecessary to repeat them here the only material circumstance of captain cook's communication to the society omitted in his journal is the following extract of a letter which he wrote to the president just before his late embarkation dated plymouth sound july seventh seventeen seventy six and is as follows i entirely agree with you that the dearness of the rob of lemons and of oranges will hinder them from being furnished in large quantities but i do not think this so necessary for though they may assist other things i have no great opinion of them alone nor have i a higher opinion of vinegar my people had it very sparingly during the late voyage and towards the latter part none at all and yet we experienced no ill effects from the want of it the custom of washing the inside of the ship with vinegar i seldom observed thinking that fire and smoke answered the purpose much better end footnote end of section twenty seven End of A Voyage Towards the South Pole and Round the World, Volume 2 by James Cook.